I'm 20 years old, female, and this was the last time I willingly stayed in a room alone with a child. I used to babysit on the weekends when I was 15. Most of the families that I babysit for were nice, sophisticated families who had sweet children that I loved. However, the Cooper family were the exception. Mr. and Mrs. Cooper had two children, Michael, who was 10, and Antoinette, who was 4. Michael was quiet, though misbehaved and crazy demented. Antoinette was loud, cheerful, and the complete opposite of her brother. She was so innocent. I truly adored Antoinette, yet I despised Michael. He was an absolute terror. I'd watch over the two children on Friday nights for three hours while their parents went on a date, meaning three awful hours of psychological, emotional, and physical torture from Psycho Michael. There were many times that I would catch Michael staring at me while I was sitting at the dining room table doing my homework. I'd tell him to quit it, but he wouldn't stop until I moved out of view. Michael was really cruel to his sister. He would push her down the stairs, pull the heads off her Barbie dolls, and cut up her clothes. Michael would also hit the cats with a sock full of quarters. One cat actually ended up dying from internal injuries. He would growl at the neighbor's dog on a good day and tape stuffed animals to windows with scissors sticking out of their heads on a really bad day. He was a horrible little kid to say the least, but the scariest part about babysitting the twerp was the night that he came for me. Let's keep in mind that I wasn't supposed to even be there that night, but Mr. and Mrs. Cooper called my mom and asked if I could babysit for them since their other arrangement had fallen through. My mom agreed without even asking me. I was supposed to babysit from 5 o'clock in the evening until 10 o'clock at night. It was storming out, so the television had no signal, and my cell phone didn't have any reception, and Antoinette was staying with her grandmother, leaving me alone with a psycho child for five whole hours. I'm glad to say that the first few hours went by pretty quickly and without incident. He was fed, bathed, and put to bed at around 8. Michael had fallen asleep the instant his head hit the pillow. I breathed a sigh of relief and lay down on the couch with headphones in, not knowing it would be a mistake. The music was loud enough to drown out any other sounds. I stared at the ceiling for a while because there was no use in trying to delve deep into the realm of social media. I drifted to sleep at some point only to be scared awake because of an intense pressure resting on my throat. Michael was standing over me with a wide smile, gripping the handle of a kitchen knife. I wasn't able to ask what he was doing due to the sudden fear that filled me. He pushed the blade harder and harder against my neck until I could feel a burning sensation. He laughed maniacally before running out of the room. I wiped the small amount of blood from my neck while searching the entire house only to panic when he was nowhere to be found. The sound of the cat screeching caused a breath to hitch in my throat. I quickly grabbed the baseball bat from the linen closet and hurried up the stairs. My hand hesitantly grabbed the doorknob to Michael's bedroom. I pushed the door open, which I still regret to this day. My screams of terror were drowned out by his laughter. Michael was sitting in the open doorway of his closet, with the carcass of the cat lying in his lap. I really do wish I could say that the horror had ended there, but it didn't. No. That twisted boy chased after me, attempting to slice my back open with every step he took. The deranged psychopath managed to get close enough to plunge the knife into my shoulder. Needless to say, I ran out of the front door and didn't stop until I was hunched over trying to catch my breath a block away from the police station. I packed up my things a few months after that moved into an apartment with my now husband 1,000 miles away from the town that I grew up in. I had to move 1,000 miles away from Psycho Michael in order to feel safe, but even that made me crazier. I attended therapy for several years afterward. I couldn't sleep without the lights on because the image of him holding a dead cat had permanently seared itself into my mind. I was paranoid for months, afraid that he would jump out from behind a corner and yet I still harbored the idea of having my own children one day. Truth be told, I honestly did care about the Cooper kids, but after the injuries I suffered, physical and psychological, my parents and I had no other choice but to press charges, at the very least to pay for medical bills and counseling. Michael, being as young as he was, was committed to a psychiatric treatment and juvenile detention for nearly three to five years from what I heard, but... 
After all the legal processes were complete, I couldn't bring myself to digging any deeper as to not relive that memory. Looking back on the incident now makes me feel silly for even being scared of a ten-year-old. It's strange how life works sometimes. It's strange how I just froze there. I eventually realized that I don't want children, and I absolutely refuse to babysit for anyone. Babysitting wasn't the job that I had imagined having while I was a senior in high school. I was paid a decent rate by the hour for watching kids that only needed to have an adult around while their parents were out. I know exactly what you're thinking. Why would you willingly waste your time watching children when you could have been working retail or some other halfway decent job? Am I close? Well, as you can imagine, the majority of kids I've looked after were happy, normal children, but my sister's children... Let me get to that. Here's a little background just to help you better understand why I don't foresee myself having children anytime soon, if ever. I'm a male and a social outcast at that. I was 16 when my mom told me that I'd be babysitting for my older sister. Naturally, I shrugged it off as it were no big deal because, I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? My sister needed to go out of town on a business trip for two days, which then caused my mom to decide that I was the right candidate for the job. I learned very quickly that kids are hungry literally every five minutes, and they have no respect for the babysitter, and they are totally out of control without their parents around. That was a bummer. Kids are perceived as sweet, innocent, and all-around pure, yet I have first-hand experience on just how truly creepy some kids can be. I had been around my nieces and nephews dozens of times before, so there wasn't any reason for me to think that they were a bit peculiar, aside from the fact that I walked in on Nat, short for Natalie, attempting to sacrifice her sister to the devil in order to bargain for immortality by shoving Lux's hand into a blender. Luckily, I was able to pry her away from the blender before she could turn it on. I had been watching them for less than 20 minutes when that incident occurred. Fast forward to this first afternoon, the kids were playing in the toy room, so I decided to watch television before doing my homework. I was in the middle of a funny movie when I cut the side of my neck with scissors. He drew a pentagram on the floor with ketchup, chanted something in a language that I didn't recognize, they probably made it up, and locked Jay in the basement. Tony was the good kid who explained that Mike was trying to summon a demon. Someone that is close to the devil so that he could bargain Jay's soul for immortality. Mike angrily hissed at me when the plan didn't work. I swear to God, those freaking creepypastas they watch really don't help them. It was then that I learned that they had a crazy obsession with vampires. The need to be immortal and trying to draw blood from people is their way to fulfill the desire to be like the people in movies or books. These kids were actually trying to figure out ways that they could become immortal without having to stay so small for all of eternity. I thought that was a bit unhealthy. I still have no idea how the internet or horror movies when their parents weren't looking really activated this, but I'm honestly still scared of what could have happened. Nat was the eldest child. She was the bad influence on her siblings. She was the entire reason why everything went down on the second night. I was studying for a calculus test that I had the next day. The kids were supposed to be playing in the backyard, which was the mistake. All I really remember about studying is that I had been exhausted from chasing around those brats the night before because I ended up falling asleep at the kitchen table. I woke up sometime in the afternoon with my hands and feet tied to a metal pipe in the basement while my deranged nieces and nephews stood over me with a weird look in their eyes. I struggled for a good ten minutes to free myself from that stupid rope as they chanted some weird language again. I assumed that they were really trying to sacrifice me, however, I was relieved when I saw one of the cats knock a candle off the windowsill. The carpet and lengthy silk curtains immediately caught fire, which caused the kids to untie me. We rushed out of the house and to safety just in time to watch the house burn, literally to the ground. I stood motionless for what seemed like hours before eventually the police were called by the neighbors. I called my mom to come get the kids before being questioned by police for over three hours. The detective that was interrogating me surely was about to arrest me, but the fire department later ruled that the fire was an accident. 
My sister angrily barged into my room once she arrived home and informed me that I was no longer allowed to babysit her kids again and literally almost beat me senseless if it wasn't for my parents stopping her fury. I cried tears of joy at the news and never babysat again. I tried to explain the story to both the detectives and my family, though my nieces and nephews stories all apparently corroborated against my own and there was nothing I could do. Needless to say, I never visited their family again, both by being shunned and by choice. Natalie and the other kids all grew out of the vampire phase from what I heard once they hit junior high and acquired less creepy, less dangerous interests. I'm 28 years old now, incredibly far away from my family, married to the most amazing woman, yet I still refuse to think about having children. You never know what they're going to get into. I've had a lot of scary experiences, but I really think this one's the scariest. It was October 2015, and my sister was giving birth, and I was babysitting her son, who was nine at the time. The second night I was there, this happened. I'd put my nephew to bed in his room, and then the dog in his cage in my sister's room, which I have to get past to get to his room. I then go downstairs, and I get on YouTube on my computer. Well, about an hour later... I hear a door slam. I just assume it's my nephew going to the bathroom. I then hear another slam. I assume it's just him wanting privacy, and I then hear a third door slam yet again. I don't know how to explain it, but I kind of just knew that it wasn't my nephew. I kept hearing things being moved around, kind of like a dresser being moved across the floor. I then start to remember that this house was built not as a regular house back in the day. The attic is apparently connected to the house next door. All you have to do is go up the attic, walk a little, then lift the top and climb down the ladder. I had no choice but to go check on my nephew. I'm still hearing noises as I go up. I hear the dog in his cage going absolutely crazy, like he was trying to get out or something. I walk halfway up the stairs, then all of the noise just stops. I look in his room and he's sleeping with his door open. There was no way in hell I was going to walk past that pitch black room. In my mind, as long as he was safe, that's all that mattered. I then walk back downstairs. As soon as I walk back downstairs, I then hear footsteps running, followed by a door slam. Well, the next day I decided to tell my sister and brother-in-law. After I told them, what they said next to me chilled me to my core. Without any concern in the world, they went on to tell me that it was the spirit of our dead neighbor. Now, you're probably thinking, why didn't I just call the cops already? Well, I wasn't really thinking straight at the time. I was just way too scared, and I guess now it's a good thing that I didn't. A few weeks later, my mom had told my oldest niece, who was 16 at the time. She said that whenever she was in there, she always felt the feeling of being watched. To this day, I still don't know if I believe it was a ghost, or maybe an actual living intruder. All I know is that I for sure wasn't alone that night besides my nephew and I. Never again will I babysit there. Screw that. I think I was only 13 years old when this happened. I would be paid extra since I was going to be babysitting so many kids. I don't recall how many, but there were a lot. The reason why I was trusted with so many was because I knew them since my parents and their parents were all friends growing up, making us kind of form into a group. Now, I was the oldest out of every single kid, which was the reason I was in charge. Of course, it was going to be a long night, knowing that our parents would be at some bar far away until like around 2 in the morning, and then stay at a hotel. For some background, I knew the kids, and they knew me. I being the oldest... 13 at the time, and the youngest being around 4. There was definitely a little bit of an age gap. The majority of the kids were around 9 to 10. Anyway, the parents left and when they did, it was already around 4 in the afternoon. About two and a half hours later, I made dinner for them. We sat down and everyone ate their pasta. Because all the kids were together and they all knew each other, things got pretty crazy. 
I won't go into detail on exactly what went down, but some of the kids were just totally wild. I didn't really mind it though. It was pretty funny at the same time, but that's besides the point. So after a couple more hours, it was getting pretty late. I recall it being around 11.30 when kids were starting to settle down. I had to take care of some of the kids who injured themselves by doing some really stupid stuff that was really dangerous and I couldn't make it in time since I had to deal with some other problems as well. But I would consider myself a very caring and kind person because I always did what I needed to do to calm them down. So like I said, it was around 11.30 when they were starting to settle down and then not too long after they were starting to pass out. I brought and carried them upstairs and put half of them in one of the two kids rooms. For the sake of keeping the real names out, basically we were at the house that belonged to the Abel's family. Ava and Dom were the kids in the family, making it their house. I put half the kids in Dom's room and the other half in Ava's room. They passed out very quickly after that. I went back downstairs to chill out and then listen to some music. After listening to music for a while, Ava comes downstairs and this is where things start to take a turn for the worst. I had to look because I was listening so loud that I couldn't even hear her calling my name. She then said in a really scared tone, Something keeps being thrown at the window in my room. I'm really scared. I was a little uneasy to be hearing this since this was such a weird thing to be happening at this time of night. I gave her a hug and I assured her that everything would be alright and that I would go check it out. The bedrooms were on the third floor, so this was especially weird since the room's windows were really high up. I went into Ava's room and I saw that the kids were sleeping. I guess no one else had heard the something hitting the window. I started to think that Ava was just making this up or something. I went back downstairs and I went to the couch where Ava was. I was a bit surprised to see that Ava wasn't there. This is when I then hear something from downstairs. It sounded like a muffled girl scream for help. I quickly ran down there to see Ava in the garage, then being dragged out of the garage by a dark figure. Someone had forgotten to close the garage door, so it was just open. I was so scared and I went into full on panic mode. I then went back inside to go grab a weapon or something that I can use in quick defense. I found this spear looking thing that's used for fires and also pushing wood in other areas. I picked it up then ran outside to look for Ava. I soon saw Ava in this really dark figure which was taking Ava in the backwoods. I then hit the dark figure in the back of the knee practically stabbing the figure since it had a sharp edge on the side of it. The figure fell back and let out a yell of pain, which is when I grabbed Ava and then practically carried her back into the house. Very stupidly, I left the weapon I had outside. Since I was in a panic, I think that I just didn't have time to think about it since Ava was the main priority for me. I get back inside and close the garage door, hoping that was the end of it. I decided not to call the cops because I get really nervous when it comes to cops, so I just wanted to avoid that. I ran upstairs but tried not to make too much noise to see if any of the kids were awake due to hearing the commotion from outside. There were only about two kids who were awake and they asked what was happening. I told them to just fall back asleep and that there was a situation that happened. They really wanted to know what but I just told them I'll tell them in the morning. I really don't blame them. I think I would also want to know what was happening especially after all that commotion. So anyway. I go back downstairs on the couch where Ava thankfully was this time and she falls asleep with the comfort of me there the whole time. Fast forward to the morning. It's around 7.30 and I can hear some commotion from upstairs. The kids were up and playing. Ava had woke me up and she was really happy to see me there. I think I really made her feel safe. After that night, me and Ava's connection was a little bit different from before. As the story is becoming better, the final spook is yet to come, so get ready. I walked downstairs to see if anything had been stolen. I check and I didn't really see anything out of the ordinary. Well, nothing out of the ordinary, except for one thing. There happened to be a paper that was in the garage. It was taped to the sliding door and I think that's why I paid attention to it. I started to read it and it said one word. Revenge. I was really scared reading this because how the hell could someone have put this here? Then reality hit me that someone had to have come inside after the garage door had been closed 
which is when I thought we were safe. I haven't shared this story with Ava because I don't want her to feel scared or threatened more than she probably already does. I do still have a few questions left unanswered though. Who did this? Why did they target this house specifically? And last but not least, did the intruder purposely try and take Ava out of everyone there? Why did he want her specifically? I know I'll probably never have my answers to these questions, but it's absolutely chilling to think about. I'm a female, and I'm 15 years old. This all started a couple months back when I got my very first job as a babysitter. I babysit on Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. Keep that in mind. The people I babysit for don't even live that far away from my house. Their house is like a block away from me. So by now you've probably guessed that I walk to work. Now, I've always been a very cautious person and also a paranoid one. So keep that in mind too. The first time it happened was after a month of doing my job. One day I got done babysitting and I just walked to my friend's house that's a couple of blocks away from their house. So as I'm walking there, I hear someone behind me. I should also mention that I was snapchatting my friend to let her know how far away from the house I was. Anyways, I hear someone behind me so I turn around and see this guy on a bike right behind me. I didn't think too much about it but I was keeping him in mind. I don't pay much attention to him and I keep snapchatting just in case he tries something. I then turn to the left and so does he. At this point I'm really aware now of what this guy is doing. I'm pretty sure he's following me. The guy looked tall as hell and I'm only 5 foot 5. So again I make a turn and so does he. By now I'm getting pretty panicked and I'm very much aware that this guy is following me. Anytime I slowed down so would he. If I sped up, again, so did he. My friend's house comes into view and I speed walk over there with him telling me. I reach her front door and I start knocking and then I hear someone say, Hey, you better watch out. I'll get you. And I turn around and the guy was right behind me in front of her house. By this point I'm very panicked but I just keep knocking and before she answers, this guy then pulls something out. At first I didn't know what it was until I looked a little closer, and you guessed it. The guy literally pulled out his penis. Right as he does that, I pull my phone up and I catch him in the act, and my friend then opens the door. She lets me inside and she asks me why I'm shaking. I then show her the video and she tries calming me down. Fast forward a week later as I'm walking to my job and I see him yet again. My heart instantly drops and I just speed walk to the lady's house which I worked for. He didn't really say anything. It was more like he was just watching me this time. This happened every single time that I would walk to work. But he wouldn't try anything because it would be daytime and most of the time someone was around. That all changed when they asked me to babysit their daughter at 10pm. I wasn't really going to walk to work alone so I asked the lady if she'd come pick me up instead. She did and of course nothing happened. We then started doing that until I was calm enough to walk by myself to work. The following week she asked me again to babysit at night so I decided to take a knife with me just in case something happens and I told my mom goodbye. I walked out in the really dark street and the lights in that area weren't really good which is why I was so scared to walk there in the first place. But anyways, I was walking to work and I then hear a crunch behind me. My body then immediately tenses up. I knew someone was there but I really dreaded thinking it was him. I decide not to look back but instead just speed walk again. For a few minutes I didn't even hear anything but I then turn around and there he fucking is. I don't say a single word and just straight up bolt to their house. I tell them what happened and she told me not to worry and that he wouldn't do anything then left me to babysit. Fast forward the second day and I walked to work and nothing happened this time. I was checking all my surroundings like a really crazy person, but no one was there. I then turned to knock on their door and from the corner of my eye, I see movement. I look and this guy's leaning out from behind trash cans and I, and I barely caught him. My heart started going crazy. I then knocked harder on the door and I saw him from the corner of my eyes just looking at me. He probably didn't even know I saw him but I did. 
Fast forward the next day and the walk to work wasn't really that much. I didn't see him, but the walk back, that's a different story. I was walking back and I think it was about 12 a.m. I texted my mom that I was on my way home and she told me to stop by the store. Now, this store is like right across from our house, so it wasn't really a big deal. This weird creep follows me, all the while making kids noises and saying really weird things like I love you over and over again. I just walk to the store and this guy literally stands right in front of the store. I get very angry at this point and I tell the cashier what's going on. He then looks at the guy for a minute and then tells him to leave. He says he wants to buy something, but the guy just tells him to leave. Well, he doesn't leave and he just keeps on standing there. So I then say to him, Why are you following me? He then says back, I'm not following you. And I said, yeah, sure you're not. And I just stand in line and get my stuff and then walk out the door. The guy has the audacity to continue following me, all while making kissing sounds and then repeatedly saying, I love you. I die for you. I was just so fucking mad at this point that I snap back and say, Look, fuck off you creep. Leave me the fuck alone already. With a very angry tone. This doesn't even have an effect on this guy, and he just keeps repeating the same shit. I then tell him, Look, I know where you live, and I'll tell your mom about this, because I've actually seen him leave the apartments that are near the store. Anyways, he doesn't even care what I'm saying, and he's making eye contact with me the entire time. I just walk to my house, and I finally get there, but right before I get inside and slam the door, I then say to him, If you ever follow me again, you're gonna fucking regret it. He responds to this by laughing, then saying, Oh yeah? What the hell are you gonna do? And proceeds to blow me a kiss. I then just walk inside, feeling very numb. I had just finally got home and I just started sobbing. My sister asked what was happening and I told her everything. She's extremely overprotective with me and she got really pissed off after I told her. She tells me that she's going to walk me to work and that if we see him she's going to kill the guy. Obviously I know that's not true but it really made me feel better. All of this happened last week and today in a couple of hours I have to babysit again. I know it doesn't seem like much, but I'm still really scared of what will happen to me in the future. I really don't even know what to do at this point. If any of you guys that are listening have some advice, please tell me what to do. I appreciate you taking the time to listen, and if anything else happens, I'll definitely give you guys an update. Be safe out there. In June of 1969, six-year-old Dennis Martin accompanied his family on a camping trip to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a mountain range rising along the Tennessee-North Carolina border in the southeastern United States. The name Great Smoky Mountains comes from the natural fog that often hangs over the range, appearing as large smoke plumes from a distance. Interestingly, this fog is caused by chemicals emitted from the local flora, chemicals that have a high vapor pressure and easily form vapors at normal temperature and pressures. Yet even having heard the scientific explanation behind the phenomenon, seeing all that fog clinging to the hilltops is a very eerie sight indeed. Hailing from nearby Knoxville, Tennessee, the Martin family had a long-running tradition of celebrating Father's Day by taking camping trips to the Great Smoky Mountains. In 1969 would mark young Dennis's first trip into the woods in the company of his father, older brother, and grandpa. The group drove out to Cades Cove, an isolated valley located in the Tennessee section of the park, then hiked out towards Russell Field, where they set up camping and began preparing for their first night under the stars. The following morning, they set off for a place known as Spence Field, a picturesque highland meadow and popular camping spot which was bisected by the rolling hills and jagged mountain peaks of the Appalachian Trail. When the group arrived at Spence Field, Dennis and his older brother set off to explore the campsite and reportedly talked to many of the other campers who had pitched their tents nearby. This is how they got talking to a ragtag group made up of other campers' children who made fast friends with the Martin boys. Dennis' father was pleased to see his son getting along so well with the other kids, 
and having his sons occupied meant the adults could get on with the important task of assembling their four-man tent. Once the task was completed, Dennis was still playing with a group of other kids, and his father says he watched as the group gleefully took up hiding positions from which to playfully ambush a group of approaching adults. When the grown-ups entered the kids' make-believe kill zone, they all jumped out, growling and roaring like wild animals as they set upon their laughing parents. All but one. All but little Dennis. His father watched with growing concern as the seconds ticked by, and Dennis had yet to emerge from his hiding spot. Eventually, he couldn't bear it anymore, and after rising from his camping chair, Dennis's father marched off the spot where he had last seen his six-year-old son, and began calling out his name. But what started out as stern, fatherly commands soon degenerated into terrified pleas, and as he continued to call out in desperation, the other families began to realize that something was terribly wrong. Once Dennis's grandpa knew he was missing, he set the group into action, sending one group two miles up the Appalachian Trail with his son, while he led another group back towards the Cades Cove Ranger Station, arriving there around 8.30 p.m. that night. Thus began an extensive, well-publicized search and rescue operation, in which National Park Service personnel was supplemented by National Guard soldiers and even a unit of Green Berets. At the peak of the search operation, more than 1,400 people were operating in the few square miles around Spencefield, but not a single one found anything that could lead them to the missing boy. However, in the aftermath of the operation, the search efforts drew a great deal of criticism from search and rescue experts far and wide who said the large number of personnel involved potentially obscuring tracks and ground that was already difficult to track over due to heavy rain. Shockingly, a shoe print belonging to that of a child was actually found at one point, but the track was dismissed as belonging to one of the Boy Scouts that was helping with the search. Later, however, Investigators kicked themselves when they found that the tracks were determined to have come from a child who was missing one shoe, which disappeared on the banks of a stream. Some suggesting it was possible that the tracks belonged to Martin, and this theory was supported when a discarded child-sized shoe and sock were found just three days later. Although search and rescue personnel continued their search for more than two weeks, scouring the hillsides night and day in continual shifts, no further clues to Martin's whereabouts were ever found. The Martin family was so understandably desperate for answers that they offered a $5,000 reward for any information that would reunite them with their beloved Dennis. This got the attention of a handful of so-called psychics, who some might argue sought to exploit the Martin family's grief and maybe cashing in if they guessed the right area of the Smokies to search. Surprisingly, None of these psychics ever proved to be of any help. Many years later in 1985, a man who had apparently been illegally collecting American ginseng in the park claimed to have come across the skeletal remains of a child while exploring the woods. The man said he should have reported the find, but was terrified of being prosecuted for his prohibited herbal hobby. Not only that, but he was also unable to point investigators in the direction of the site he'd found the bones in the first place. There have been many theories that have attempted to explain what happened to young Dennis Martin that day. Most detectives, both amateur and professional, believe that Dennis became disoriented whilst looking for a hiding place, maybe even forgetting his way back to camp when he emerged from it. Either way, Dennis then strayed further from the camp and could easily have fallen down one of the many steep slopes and ravines that dotted the area surrounding Spencefield. However, Dennis was wearing a bright red t-shirt when he went missing, not something that would be easy for search and rescue teams to miss. Dennis would have to be completely covered in foliage to remain undetected with that color of shirt, and despite it being feasible due to his small size, the likelihood of that is extremely low. Others are quick to remind us of the presence of black bears in the area, as well as copperhead vipers and feral pigs all of which would have posed a considerable threat to six-year-old Martin. Park rangers told investigating police that an underweight bear had been caught in a boar trap in the Spencefield area just two weeks earlier. Although the bear was released safely, the incident suggested that it may have been struggling to find enough food, prompting to turn to a less familiar source of food. Yet however tragic and brutal the aforementioned theories are, 
Dennis's father believes something considerably more sinister. Based on the eyewitness account of one Harold Key, who says he heard a loud scream on the very same afternoon that Dennis disappeared, Dennis's dad firmly believed that his son was kidnapped by an opportunistic predator. Shortly after he heard the scream, Harold Key claimed to have seen a disheveled, bearded man with wild, unkempt hair fleeing through the woods in an apparent bid to remain undetected by the nearby campers. Harold's family went on to explain that they saw a flash of red on the figure's shoulders, which some believe was actually Dennis himself, slung over the shoulder of this mysterious figure as they carried him away. Harold later speculated that the man may have been a moonshiner, explaining his reluctance to be seen. Despite the report, FBI investigators ultimately dismissed it, saying that as much as Harold meant well, his account was frankly unreliable as his timeline of events were off. But one retired park ranger lamented the failure to properly follow up either the footprints or the sighting of the rough-looking man, arguing that as the location of the sighting was downhill from where Dennis disappeared, it was possible to cover that distance in the time frame, even carrying a child, but that the individual in question would have some impressive strength, stealth, and endurance. So if this is the case, who is this hairy mystery man, this bearded vagrant who was apparently capable of such an impressive physical feat, even if it was in the context of the despicable abduction of a child? Given the lack of investigation into his sighting or his tracks, it seems we might never know. But even if we did get to the bottom of the mystery of a man living in the Appalachian Mountains with a penchant for kidnapping children, I don't think the answers would bring us any solace. Maybe the closure would be worth it, especially for the family, but nightmares can be a high price to pay, and wondering what happened to young Dennis Martin can give even the most hardened true crime reader some very sleepless nights. My cousin Ethan and I grew up together, but I never liked him very much. His family was rich, so he always had the best stuff. Mine wasn't, and I didn't. On Halloween of 1985, we were going trick-or-treating together. I was the Terminator. He was Freddy Krueger. His mask cost almost $100, and it looked exactly like Freddy's face. The scars, the sneers, everything was just right. I didn't have a mask. My parents couldn't afford one. I had torn aluminum foil taped to the side of my face. It was meant to look like the Terminator after some skin had been ripped off. A few splotches of ketchup on the foil were supposed to look like blood. As soon as it dried, it looked very little like dried blood and very much like dried ketchup. Despite my terrible costume, I was still excited to trick or treat. We didn't have candy very often at home, except maybe on Easter. My parents encouraged me to go to as many houses as I wanted to get all the candy I would be able to eat. It felt good to know they wanted me to be happy. Ethan and I went out at sundown and visited house after house. Every time the homeowners would gush over Ethan's mask, they would tell him how scary it was, how realistic. Then they would turn to me and ask me who I was supposed to be. I would answer, and then they would say something like, Oh, of course. How could I have missed it? I could tell they felt sorry for me. One even handed me a few extra pieces of candy. When we were done, our pillowcases were stuffed with treats of every sort. We began the long walk back home. As we went, Ethan rooted around his bag of loot. I could hear him grumbling and complaining through his mask. Then he started throwing candy on the street, stuff he didn't like. Go ahead and pick it up if you want it, Bill. I know you can't afford to let anything go to waste. He called out, heaving handful after handful into the gutter. I didn't say anything, but I reached into my pocket and pulled out a lighter and two cigarettes I had stolen from my dad. I had been smoking on and off for the last few months. Even at 13, I knew it was bad for me. I just didn't care. It made me feel good. I stayed a few steps behind Ethan as he tossed more candy away. As much as I hated myself for it, I ended up picking up a few pieces off the ground and putting them in my bag. Ethan caught me once and laughed. <laughs> You're gonna be as fat as your mom if you eat all that. I kept my mouth shut. Is that why she got fired from the restaurant? Did she eat a customer's food? 
I knew Ethan was joking, as he did often. I'm sure in his mind he thought he was being harmless and playful. Still, I told him more than a few times to leave my mom out of the jokes. She had diabetes, and she hadn't mentioned it to anyone other than my dad and me, but the doctor told her that she might end up losing her foot. That's why the restaurant had to let her go. She couldn't walk around and wait tables anymore. Change the subject, Ethan, I said. I knew he heard me, and he didn't talk for another minute or so, until he did again. Hey, you think her and your dad still fuck? I wonder how he even manages to get it in there. <laughs> he cackled, then insisted. Okay, 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 I'm sorry, I'm done, promise. I seethed as we took a shortcut through the elementary school soccer field. Let's stop here for a minute, Ethan said. We had gotten to the school's playground. I bet I could scare the shit out of some kids if they come by. He sat on one of the swings, with his pillowcase on his lap. He kicked his legs, and the swing moved back and forth. I stood there, hating him. I think I see some kids coming over the hill, I told Ethan. I'm going to hide behind the slide, and sneak up on them if they come over to you. Go for it, Ethan told me, his voice deep and distorted through the mask. I left Ethan on the swing set and walked over to the slide. I watched him on the swing, as his hateful words rang in my ears. Tears came to my eyes, as I remembered my mom smiling from her spot on the couch as she encouraged me to go out and have fun. She was such a good person. She never said anything negative about Ethan. In fact, she always complimented him on his grades, and his wins in basketball, and even his looks. You're going to be a handsome man someday, Ethan. She told him, I bet we'll see your face in a magazine someday. Even after her kindness, Ethan still felt it was okay to trash her. I heard him laughing to himself across the playground. I didn't know why exactly, but I thought I had a pretty good idea. I reached in my jacket pocket for another cigarette, knowing a smoke would calm me down. But it had come apart. My pocket was full of loose tobacco and paper and the lighter. Ethan was still laughing as I fingered the lighter in my pocket for a second. Then I pulled it out. I walked up behind him. Ethan didn't know I was there as he shouted. Okay, one more thing and I'll never say anything about her again. But unless your dad's got a big dick, he'll never manage to- I flicked the lighter near the back of Ethan's neck, right where his hair and the mask met. The hair went up quickly, using his hairspray as an accelerant. Then something happened I didn't expect. The mask burst into flames. Ethan jumped off the swing and ran in a loose circle, trying to pull the mask off his head. I saw it ripping under his fingers. He couldn't get a grip. The material bubbled. His screams barely muffled as the molten chemicals clung to his skin, echoing off the brick walls of the elementary school. After a few seconds, he fell and rolled around on the playground, pushing his head into the sand to try to put out the fire. He succeeded, but the damage was done. He turned over on his back, no longer screaming, but gasping and shallow hyperventilated breaths. In the moonlight, I saw the mask was completely fused to what remained of his skin. One of his eyes had completely burst, but his other darted around, almost like he was confused and wondering where he was. I saw something moving on the other side of the field. Kids were coming. I yelled to them to call an ambulance, and I waited, unsure of how I felt, until the paramedics got there. I took complete responsibility for setting Ethan on fire. I said I had been sneaking up to scare him by flicking the lighter near his face. And yes, I got into a lot of trouble, but everyone believed it was an accident. Ethan's face was destroyed. He had skin grafts and bone grafts and all sorts of reconstructive surgery, but he never recovered, not physically or emotionally. He killed himself in 1990. His parents held a very expensive funeral. I was invited. They had forgiven me for my part in his accident years before. In fact, their subsequent lawsuit against the mask company is the reason why Halloween masks are now made with flame retardant materials. My mom died a few years before Ethan, 
but not before complications from her diabetes took her left leg. Dad and I were with her in the hospital. At the same time, Ethan's parents were there to see him through another round of reconstructive surgery. They visited Mom, Dad, and I while Ethan was still under, recovering after a successful set of grafts. We chatted for a while about Mom's hopes for recovery, and then the topic moved to Ethan. Ethan's mom was gushing about how a plastic surgeon had recently joined the hospital after working in Switzerland. He was the best, apparently. He had taken on Ethan's case earlier in the year, albeit remotely. He wrote a substantial article about the new techniques he would be employing. In the world of plastic surgery, it made a big splash, if only for its ambition. Ethan's mom reached into her purse and pulled out the publication. She flipped it open to the page that showed various photographs of Ethan's burns, along with notes and explanations the doctor had written to accompany the article. I could tell mom was holding back tears. I knew why, too. Her eyes met mine, and she couldn't hold back any longer. She began to weep. Dad and Ethan's mother held her while she cried. I just watched. Mom was thinking that she had been right all those years ago. She had been right for all the wrong reasons, but right nonetheless. Just like she had predicted, Ethan's face had finally made it into a magazine. On Halloween night 2002, 21-year-old Chris Jenkins, a University of Minnesota student, went to celebrate the spookiest night of the year down at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill with his girlfriend, Ashley Rice, and three other friends. Shortly after midnight, Chris was separated from his friends and ejected from the bar. According to reports later given to police, a drink was accidentally spilled on his pants, and the security supervisor assumed that Chris was so intoxicated that he urinated himself. After Chris was removed, the security guard in question was given instructions not to let him back inside. Unfortunately for Chris, since his Native American Halloween costume had no pockets, he had asked Ashley to keep his wallet, keys, and cell phone in her purse for him, and his coat was left inside the bar on what turned out to be a chilly 20-degree night. Since he was not the designated driver, Chris was unable to get a ride home and could not contact his friends inside the bar. He was last seen headed away from the bar on foot, but did not return to his residence and was eventually reported missing. On February 27th the following year, Chris Jenkins' bloated, decaying corpse was found floating beneath a bridge on the Mississippi River. He was still dressed in his Halloween costume and had gotten wedged in the branches of a large tree located next to the upper St. Anthony Falls Dam. The medical examiner found no signs of foul play on Chris's body, so the official cause of death was listed as drowning. Despite the police ruling it a death by misadventure, his family launched their own independent investigation and discovered a number of odd discrepancies. The Jenkins family hired a private detective, Chuck Loesch, to further investigate their son's disappearance. When Loesch questioned staff at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill, they maintained that Chris left the bar on his own and the venue's owner eventually issued a gag order instructing employees not to speak to anyone without an attorney. Loesch also contacted the Federal Reserve Bank, who happened to be the owners of the two CCTV cameras that had a good view of the Hennepin Avenue Bridge. The bridge was on the route that Jenkins was likeliest to have taken, but when the bank checked the surveillance footage from the earlier morning hours of November 1st, there was no sign of him. Loesch's investigation also led him to multiple witnesses who each independently recalled a fight that had occurred in front of a local pizza place. Though it was unclear if the victim was Chris, a gang of around nine or ten people had violently attacked another outside of the restaurant. Mike Casey, an off-duty police officer, was present in the area on the night of Jenkins' disappearance. He was moonlighting as a security guard for the nearby Hennepin Center for the Arts and was introduced to Jenkins by his girlfriend, Ashley Rice. Ashley happened to work at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill and was familiar with Casey, well enough that she had borrowed pieces of his uniform to complete her cliched sexy cop costume. There are rumors that Casey had in fact masterminded Jenkins' removal from the bar as a way to get to Ashley, given that he actually gave her a ride home later that night when her shift finished. The Minneapolis Police Department never formally questioned Casey, 
but stated that he's a married man with children. We don't want to break up a family. An incriminating statement, indeed. The Jenkins family went as far as hiring two separate groups of bloodhound trackers to trace Chris's scent from the Lone Tree Bar across the street to an underground parking garage. The scent trail led to parking stalls that one of the bar's bouncers was reportedly parked in on Halloween night. A bloodhound produced a mild hit for Chris's scent on this person's vehicle. Droplets of blood residue, a piece of red string, and red feather fragments which possibly belonged to the headband of Jenkins' costume were also found in the garage. Jenkins' blood alcohol was only 0.12%, so he could not have been particularly drunk, but coroners noted that traces of GHB were found in Chris's system. However, since GHB is a substance which is produced by the body naturally, this did not necessarily mean Chris was drugged. Forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Baden took issue with Jenkins' body being found with his arms crossed in front of him. Drowning victims who accidentally fall into water are almost always found face down with their arms outwards towards their sides and their clothing disheveled. Yet Jenkins' shirt was tucked into his drawstring pants and his oversized slip-on moccasins were still on his feet. This led to speculation that Chris was already dead when he was placed in the river. Hydrologists who studied the Mississippi River were highly skeptical that Chris's body could have been in the water for as long as four months without ever being seen, as the river did not freeze over until January 2003. What's more, the area beneath the Third Avenue Bridge was searched in the weeks following his disappearance, with no sign of him. A daytime thawing occurred on February 27th, the day Chris was found, so he possibly floated from another location before his body got wedged in the trees. Jenkins' family found it extremely unusual that there was no bruising on his body. Their son was an enthusiastic lacrosse player, a goalie in fact, who often came home from practice with huge purple and yellow patches on his legs and forearms. Since these bruises were not present, his parents believed he may have been alive for a couple of days after he went missing, allowing enough time for his bruises to heal. Three years later in 2006, the Jenkins family met with Minneapolis Police Chief Tim Dolan, who had decided to reopen the investigation based on the newly attained evidence. Chris's death was eventually reclassified as a homicide and Chief Dolan held a press conference to issue a formal apology to the Jenkins family. Years later, Dolan would state that he estimated Jenkins' death was 50% chance of homicide, 30% chance of accidental death, and 20% chance of ending his own life. Once the case of Jenkins' death was reopened, an informant told authorities he had witnessed somebody throw Chris's body off the Hennepin Avenue Bridge into the Mississippi River, but there was skepticism about this story since Chris had no broken bones or injuries, and it would not have been possible to toss him over the bridge's high safety railing without his body hitting a steel support beam and vertical metal cables on the way down. In July 2007, the Hennepin County District Attorney's Office announced that they had been approached about filing charges against a suspect for Chris's murder, but declined to do so. The suspect in question was one Jeremy Alford, who was serving a life sentence for the brutal murder of a man by the name of Douglas Miller. Alfred admitted to being a regular drinker down at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill around the time of 2002. Chris's case also had been connected to the infamous Smiley Face Killer, as his death took place around the same time that many college-aged men in the Midwest were discovered dead in bodies of water after a night of drinking. But unlike many of the other cited cases, no Smiley Face graffiti has ever been discovered in relation to Chris's death. I thought it would be kind of fun to share a spooky event that happened to me a few years ago around Halloween. I had just moved to my current flat in Rains Park, Southwest London, and I was fairly unfamiliar with the area. Now my current bosses and supervisors know that I'm fighting a losing battle when it comes to the reliability of the Southwest trains, and as a result have less than reliable timekeeping when it comes to arriving to work on time. A battle that I had hoped to circumvent with the purchase of a bicycle. Sadly, though, 
the London weather and my inherent idleness jointly conspire to once again force me to take the trains to and from work. While some people are more than aware that the trains keep me from arriving to work on time, not many of you are aware of the troubles I have returning home. That is to say, I have many a time found myself stuck at Clapham Junction with no train to take me back to Rhines Park. In these circumstances, I have to take a bus to Wimbledon Common and walk the remaining three miles on foot. It is actually quite a pleasant walk. London doesn't have many hills if I walk along the ridgeway. You can actually occasionally catch a nice view. True, it is of Croydon, but a nice view nonetheless. Now to call Wimbledon Village a privileged area would be an understatement. The driveways are home to sports cars and luxury utility vehicles. So you can imagine I have very uneventful walks home. I rarely see anyone on the trip about, from the odd older couple, perhaps walking home from a late dinner party, or even a person walking their dog. The neighborhood is quiet and gets to bed early, and that night was just like the others, initially. I had gotten off the bus at the War Memorial, walked through the village center, and turned onto the Ridgeway. My phone battery had died somewhere between Wandsworth and Southfields, so I had to do the walk without music, and this always made the walk seem longer. My usual practice was to walk along and look at the houses and try to guess what the people that lived in the houses would be like. Fast car, business types, SUV and toy still in the front yard, larger family, that kind of thing. I was playing my game and decided to have a cigarette, so I stopped. I was searching for my lighter and looking around when I noticed that I was not the only one on the street. Now this was unusual but hardly alarming. What was strange, however, was that the person wasn't the sort I had grown used to seeing. It was a young lady. She appeared to be drunk, or tired perhaps. I lit my cigarette and paused for a second. Just a quick second to judge to see if she would be capable of making it home by herself, or perhaps maybe she would need me to call someone for her. It was at this point that I realized that she was crying. I started to walk over to her to make sure she was alright. She stopped walking and immediately froze. I noticed that she was in some sort of Halloween costume. A schoolgirl, in fact. And as I got closer, I began to realize that she was in fact around the age of 15 or 16. She was deathly white. Her makeup must have been professionally done, or she had spent an incredibly long time preparing it. I began to think that maybe her friends had made fun of her costume, and she had run off from whatever party she had been at, drunk and upset. I started to feel a bit unnerved when I noticed that she was staring directly at me as I approached. I can assure you that in a city the size of London, we have an unspoken rule of avoiding eye contact with strangers at all costs. It was at this point I assumed that she was under the influence of something other than alcohol, and I decided to be a bit more cautious. I stopped about four or five feet away from her and spoke. Are you okay? You seem to be a little upset. Are you in any sort of trouble? Nothing from her part aside from that stare. Have you had a little too much to drink? Maybe some smoke? Yeah, right. I know hallucinogens when I see them. There was still no response. Do you need a taxi home? Do you remember where you live? At this, the girl began to cry. But this time, she was absolutely wailing. I could feel her raw sense of despair. I actually flinched at the sound. It was positively unbearable. She was dancing on the border of hysterics, perhaps even putting one foot along the line to see what would happen. I was stunned. I wanted to console her and run in equal measures. I wanted to comfort her and chastise at the same time. All I managed was a meek, why are you crying? She must have heard me somehow because she began to draw herself back from the edge of what can only be described as a complete breakdown. She was still heavily sobbing, but once again, she brought her eyes up to mine and said very softly, because you're gonna die. Now I've been unfortunate enough to witness death firsthand on more than one occasion. Suffice it to say that these events have always left me with a lot to think about and I in fact have come to terms with my own mortality quite early in life. It struck me that perhaps, like too many of us had, this young lady had someone quite close to her die recently. 
Perhaps she was going through the same dark realizations that follow being in the company of death. The same thoughts that can keep children up at nights and the pews full at churches. I wanted to let her know that everything would be fine and that death was simply a part of life. All I managed, however, was a slightly incredulous, I know. At this, she seemed slightly taken aback, almost angry. She responded, You are going to die, and he is going to kill you. Alarms went off in my head. I began to feel a bit more threatened. I decided right then and there that talking this girl down from whatever bad high she was on was no longer my responsibility. Had not the venerable Hunter S. Thompson himself warned us of the dangers of underestimating the ability of a drug to take control of a person. Uh, good luck, I said, and with that, turned and began to walk away. After about five steps, I quickly looked back to see her still standing there. She put her head down and began to audibly sob again. I quickened my pace and shortly had walked along the natural bend in the road, leaving her out of sight. I left a bit agitated. I remember putting my headphones back in my ears and trying to listen to music from my phone, only to be reminded that it was still out of power. I was still two miles away from home, but at the pace I was walking, I was confident I could cover the ground in less than 20 minutes. No less than two minutes later, as when I first heard the shouting, it was a man's voice layered within an excruciating sense of malice and rage. I am coming for you. I couldn't quite place where the voice had come from, but it seemed as though he was at some distance behind me, on the same road, possibly from where the girl had been. I immediately realized that I was to be the victim of some sort of Halloween prank. I didn't, however, slow down. I imagined at this point that I was supposed to get scared and begin to run and I was determined not to play along. The man yelled again, and this time he seemed to be significantly closer. I hate you. Now the voice had seemed to come from somewhere close by behind me. That is to say, at the volume of the voice, I would have expected to have seen the man addressing me, but I was still very much alone on the street. I was walking quite fast, so the person yelling at me must have been running. Yet I heard no other footsteps. There was obviously more than one prankster, and they had various hiding spots along the street. I quickly decided to be a rather poor sport and cut off the main road and go down Thornton Road by the Swan Pub. I hate to admit that their practical joke had gotten the better of me, and I did not want to see what they had in store for me next. I made it to the front of the second house on the street when I heard that terrible voice shout at me again. You are going to die. This time the voice seemed to have come from the entrance of the street, less than 80 feet away, perhaps a last chance at scaring me before I disappeared into the darker side of the street. Since these streets were darker, I decided that I would lose no pride in starting to jog down the hill. I knew it was all probably fun and games, but the ferocity of the shouting left me worried that I could in fact be dealing with a real maniac. True, it would have been interesting to be a part of the most elaborate mugging I had ever heard of, but that voice just left me with the impression of true hatred. I didn't want to meet the person, or people rather, that could mimic and channel such malignant feelings at will. I had made it to the curve where Thornton Road becomes Thornton Road, when all of a sudden, I will kill you. This time the voice seemed to be directly to the right of me. He must have been hidden behind the fence of some house, or perhaps, even within the house itself, I had obviously walked right into their trap. I broke into a sprint at this point, pride be damned. I began to run quite fast, and then faster, straight downhill. At this point, I actually was starting to panic. My mind was playing terrible tricks on me, and it seemed as though the voices were all around me, constantly yelling at me, constantly screaming. Up ahead was the main road. Whirlpool Road to be precise, well lit, busy, and I could hail a cab and be home in minutes, but the voices, the immensity. I hate you, you coward. Die, die, die. 
Every second, all around me, the adrenaline must have been heightening my every sense. I admit, I was scared. And it seemed as though for some reason, that terrible voice was booming off every surface on the street. It felt as though I was simultaneously running away and into a mad rage. The words felt like gusts of terrible hot wind, pushing its venomous anger at me. I couldn't take it anymore. The voice seemed to make me sure that same intense anger, and I thought to myself, am I the one shouting? And I felt like a victim. I wanted to fucking kill the people who were playing this fucked up trick on me. I felt the hatred. Time to die, coward. I hate you. I decided to give up. In one quick moment, I decided I would stop running as fast as I could and have a cigarette and wait for these people to show themselves. I quickly stopped running and spun around. A car beeped as it raced past exactly where I would have run to had I not stopped at that exact moment. In my blind panic, I had run past the sidewalk of the main road and onto the actual road and had avoided being run down by inches. I looked up the road I had come from. Darkness. Silence. Whoever had been up there was gone now. I lit my cigarette and took a few moments to calm down. Smoking had saved my life that night. I went home after that and nothing more happened to me. But as I was standing there trying to calm down, working through the panic and adrenaline, I seemed to remember hearing a soft whisper. Perhaps it's just my imagination, but I thought I heard a girl's voice softly saying, Not such a coward after all. I was 13 years old when this happened on Halloween night in 2015. Since I had been sitting around all day, at 9pm I decided to go for a walk out in the woods. It was one of my favorite things to do, since everything looked so different out in the dark and that there were no people around. I really loved the cool night air and the spooky feeling of the woods and the nearby pond. I would started walking past my neighbor's blue house when they were having a huge Halloween party. There were flashing lights at the windows and music blaring, and I could hear all the drunk people raving in the yard. But soon enough, I had made it to the quiet woods like I had planned. As I was walking on the forest path, I started to feel very nervous and paranoid. I couldn't really see where I was going, and eventually had to take my earbuds off to be more aware of my surroundings. The feeling of uneasiness started to fade for a moment as I made it through the woods and onto a street near the one I lived on. I turned the corner back to my street, my earbuds back on, and blasting Nightcore, now almost relieved that I was almost home. I started to think I was being stupid for getting so jumpy over nothing, but then a thin figure appeared from behind the still lively blue house, and I immediately tensed back up. As the figure got closer, I placed my house keys between my fingers like I learned from the internet and tried to make out what I was seeing. The figure was a man fairly tall, bald, and wearing a black suit. He was also ghost white and due to my poor vision, I literally almost shit myself thinking it was Slenderman himself coming to take me. A moment later though, I noticed that he did in fact have a face and he had painted it to look like a skull. The man was obviously wasted and he was staggering in a zigzag motion across the empty street right towards me. For a split second, I was hoping he was too hammered to even notice me, but that hope quickly faded as he made his way right to me. I was absolutely paralyzed with fear. My house was only two houses away, but I'd have to get past this unpredictable man and I had no idea if I could outrun him with my asthma. Panicking, I was considering other ways to get away from him and to safety. Could I turn back and maybe take a long way around to the other end of my street? No. It's dark. There's no one around, and I could definitely not run for that long. Can I make it to my grandma's house? Can't do that either. There's no guarantee that she's awake or even home. As I was trying to decide, my thoughts were interrupted as the man put a hand tightly on my shoulder. He started speaking, but I couldn't hear him properly due to my music still playing in my ears. All I managed to hear was him questioning what girl my age was doing out alone so late at night. I could only stand there and stare. 
The man then paused, raised his arm, and then pointed a finger to the woods behind the houses, and then said something. It was at this point that I decided if I didn't do something, soon my body would definitely end up being found in the woods. I looked at the woods, then at the guy, shook him off, and broke into a full-on sprint past him at my house, crossing some of that blue house's property. At my front door, I was furiously stabbing my key into the old rusting lock with my shaky hands, fearing that any second that man would come grab me from behind and drag me into the dark forest on the other side of my yard. I finally managed to get inside and made sure the door stayed locked before I could finally breathe again. I threw my shoes off and made my way into the basement as my tears started rolling down my face. Sobbing, I had told my older brother what was going on, and together we called our parents who weren't home at the time. They said they would check it out, and we didn't call the police, since it was a little town and no harm was actually done. The next day, my dad had informed me that the drunk man was actually just one of the taxi drivers in our town, and we just never spoke of it again. It's six years later, and I still get extremely nervous going outside after dark, even though I don't live anywhere near that place anymore. I've told this story to my friends a few times, and it honestly sort of annoys me that I didn't get as much as an apology from that guy. I really honestly hate the whole town, and the fact that no one there does anything when things like this happen. I'm glad I live in a bigger place now, where we at least have street lights. I'm only 19, and I've honestly experienced enough scary and traumatizing things for two lifetimes. That being said, I'm very street smart and always have been. I live right in front of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. This particular story happened when I was in 8th grade. Names have been changed for obvious reasons. My friend Jess threw a little Halloween party at her house on the night of Halloween. There were four other girls as well as two guys besides me and Jess. Megan, Cara, Emily, Bella, Chris, and Zach. Everything was going just fine, and we all took pictures in our costumes, and then took Jess's little cousin trick-or-treating around the neighborhood for a while. I'd also like to add that this was in a decent neighborhood, and crime doesn't really happen in this area. After taking her cousin trick-or-treating, we went back to Jess's house and grabbed hoodies since it was getting cold out, and we decided to walk around. Jess grabbed her Beats pill, and the eight of us walked around the neighborhood together with the music on low, just barely enough to hear it unless you were near. We didn't see anyone out trick-or-treating anymore, so we decided to go park near Jess's house. It was about 9 o'clock or so at this point, so it really wasn't too late at all. The playground and the swings were at least 50 yards from the sidewalk, and you had to walk through a large open field in order to get to it. The playground was hidden due to a bunch of large trees surrounding the playground. You would really only be able to see it if you were walking on the sidewalk or in the trees. Once we got to the playground, we all put our phones and just put our Beats pill on the park bench, and we headed straight to the playground to just hang out. Everybody was all having their own individual conversations with one another, considering there were eight of us. I was sitting next to Cara and Jess in the playground, while Mega, Emily, Bella, and Chris were sitting on those bars slash walls of the playground. Zach was the only one not on the playground. When we all briefly glanced at a group of men with their hoods up, coming right out of the trees near the sidewalk that was about 40 yards away. They weren't doing anything, but they were beginning to walk along the sidewalk that we were just on before. We didn't really think anything of it, so we just minded our business and continued chatting amongst each other. About a minute or so later, everybody gets quiet, and Cara jumps up randomly and begins running off the playground. Roughly two seconds later, I see Megan, Bella, Emily, Chris, and Zach all gone and out of sight. Jess and I were sitting on the playground, a bit hidden, and were very confused as to what was going on. I then turned around, and I saw either five or six men, all dressed in black, each wearing masks, all with long knives or metal baseball bats in their hands. They weren't running, but they were walking very fast towards us. I knew there was something wrong the second I saw their demeanor, almost like they were up to something. And for anyone asking how I knew they were men, they were very tall and had a really big build underneath whatever they were wearing. I looked at Jess and she was just as scared as I was, 
considering all our friends had left us behind without even saying a word. The men were right next to the park benches that we had left our phones on, still walking fast. And Jess, not thinking clearly, decides to run up to the park bench and grab her beats pill, out of fear that they were going to steal it. I waited for her, because I knew I couldn't live with it if she got caught by them. At this point, Jess starts running back towards me so we can get the hell out of there. Jess and I start panicking on what to do or where to go because this park is so secluded and all we're surrounded by is trees. I turn to see where my friends went and I see a couple of them climbing rocks that led to a fence that basically has nothing but forest behind it. That's when I then see a couple of the men start chasing after them on the rocks and I instantly had to think because I knew that the other men were coming up right behind Jess and I. Jess and I ran towards the end of the fence because we knew we wouldn't get up the rocks fast enough. Jess immediately made it to the other side of the fence where our other friends were, while I, being the 4'11 girl that I am, was absolutely struggling to get over the fence. I looked to my left to see where the men were, and two men were sprinting right towards me as they noticed I was struggling to get over the fence. And I swear, maybe five seconds before one of the men caught up to me, I was actually able to make it over. At this point, I didn't know where anybody was, and I was all alone. I could see the two men getting ready to hop the fence to come after me, and that's when I took off running. I tried to stay low, though, because I knew that the other three men were still around somewhere, and I didn't know if they had my friends or what the hell was going on. My first instinct was to find the first house I could with the lights on, and luckily enough, it wasn't long before I did. I ran straight through their backyard and then started pounding on their door, without a single care in the world of how creepy that must have been for them. Luckily they were having a party too, and after I explained the whole situation quickly, the guys in that house went out into the trees to go find these men and go look for my friends. All of my friends and I were safely at this house by this point, but the men that went to go look for them weren't back yet. The ladies in the house called the cops and explained the situation, and about five minutes later, the guys from the house came back, and one of them had actually been punched in the face. The cops eventually arrived and checked everywhere we had been. They didn't even see anybody walking in the area, but they did find all our phones still sitting on the bench where we left them. This might not be that scary to some, but it was truly terrifying for me and those I was with, considering we weren't bothering anybody. One of the guys trying to help us got punched. They all had weapons of some sort and they clearly weren't trying to rob us or they would have taken our phones that were right there. I never found out who those men were or what their intentions were with their weapons. All I know is I never went to a park late at night ever again. And neither should you. I actually had a pretty decent scare back when I was 14, and I'm in my early 20s now so some of the more intricate details are a little hazy, but I'll try to tell it as accurately as I can remember. So, the story happened on Halloween night in 2013. Me and my three friends, Dallas, AJ, and Infernee, had all collectively decided that we would meet up at my house to begin trick-or-treating, as my house was located right next to the wealthier neighborhood in the city. Our game plan to maximize our trick-or-treating efficiency was to start off in my house, then work our way down towards the nice neighborhood, and then loop around. Before we began, Anthony mentioned that he had bought some weed, and so we all smoked some in the alleyway by my house before we began. We made our way through my neighborhood, in a decent bit into the nice neighborhood before we decided to start heading back so we could get to the houses on the opposite side of the street as we started making our way towards my house. Unfortunately, it was already pretty late at this point, and so a lot of the houses had already started turning off their lights. By the time we were almost out of the nicer neighborhood, just about every house had turned their lights off, except for this one that was attached to a bunch of other townhouses. We being the desperate candy-starved teenagers that we were, weren't going to let the late hour of the night sway us from our potential earnings. So we all made our way up onto the porch and rang the doorbell. We waited for a decent bit, probably a good 30 seconds, before we finally heard some loud thumping behind the door. It was an older male, probably in his early 40s. He answers the door in a stained tank top and a pair of denim boxers. The guy looked like he hadn't showered or shaved in like a solid week, 
but he did seem pretty nice though, despite his appearance. And he made some sort of joke about us being the only trick-or-treaters out there, as we had stayed out later than everyone else, and so we deserved a better reward than the rest of them. He told us to wait there just for a moment while he went and got some treats for us. None of us really found his appearance weird, and I partially blamed the weed that we'd smoked earlier, as we weren't as paranoid about him as much as we were paranoid that some cops would see us walking down the street and somehow know that we smoked. We heard his thumping footsteps as he walked around his house, and then a couple of minutes later, he then came back with some black DVD boxes. He held them out like a deck of cards, and he told us to take what we wanted. As he said this, he cracked a smile, and I remember thinking about just how gross his yellow jagged teeth were. We looked at the covers, and they were all adult movies, some of them not even featuring females on the cover. AJ made a comment about the movies, saying we just wanted candy, but the guy just smiled wider with his crooked yellow teeth, seeming to stick out of his mouth, and then he said, I know what kids your age like to do. Don't worry. It's okay. You can trust me. I'm cool. At this point, me and my friends all began awkwardly shuffling away from the porch, politely declining his offer. When the man put his hands on his underwear, then started rubbing himself as he begged us to stay and then come inside so we could watch movies together. He said that he'd let us eat all the candy we want and other really disturbing things. While he was still going on his tangent, me and my friends all collectively decided to book it towards my house pillowcases full of candy awkwardly being shuffled in our arms. We ran out of the nice neighborhood and down this large hill that the nice neighborhood set on top of, before forking it left onto the city street that would lead to my house. Before we made it out of the nice neighborhood, I remember looking back and seeing the grown man chase after us for the first part, but then giving up shortly after and going back into his house. We eventually made it to my house and went directly into the basement through a set of stairs that was in the back of my house. While we were in there, we all collectively talked about just how insane what happened was, and we wondered if the weed we smoked had made it seem weirder or maybe more normal than it actually was. Either way, we egged his house the next day and we never went back there for Halloween ever again. This event occurred when I was 10 years old on Halloween night. At the time, I was still a stick-thin girl with nothing to actually distinguish that I was a girl. Especially since earlier that year, I decided I didn't want to be confused with my twin sister anymore. So I had gotten a pixie cut and I had began dressing in black. At the time, I had no girlfriends, but up the road half a mile was my friend Austin and another mile and a half up, Quinn. I had really become close with them and would often go exploring and fishing with them, so it was only natural that we decided that the three of us would go trick-or-treating together. Compared to Austin in my neighborhood, Quinn's was the more wealthier one, so in hopes of getting the best candy, we decided we'd go to Quinn's. I had been to Quinn's house a few times, but most of the time we hung out, we'd walk another mile up from Quinn's to the Rudders, which was our local gas station for Slurpees and then another two miles down from my house to the park and lake. So Austin and I weren't too familiar with this neighborhood and the ones around it. But I digress. My mother had a new boyfriend at the time, so she didn't really care what I was doing. She would have gotten mad if she'd known I was hanging out with boys again. It was Pennsylvania, so it was super cold. So any costume I had on was pretty much covered with my jacket and leggings. I had been a dark fairy, so you could still guess what I was just because of the black sparkly wings. Anyways, I had left early to go walk to Austin's house. When I got there, I had to ask Austin what he was because he was in a white button-up, black dress pants, as well as a tie and a heavy black jacket over it. He moved his jacket to show me the cheap sheriff's badge attached to his belt and told me he was a detective. I had laughed and his parents shooed us away. I remember his dad grumbling about what was a boy doing with sparkly wings, when I then realized he'd been talking about me, which definitely dampened my spirits. Austin's dad was drinking though, so I didn't correct him. Austin attempted to cheer me up the entire way to Quinn's house, and soon all was forgotten. 
Quinn's house was the biggest house I had ever been at at the time. It was in a really nice neighborhood with houses on each side that looked just like his. Quinn's mother welcomed us warmly, and she had gave us treats to start off our trick-or-treating. Quinn definitely had the best costume of all of us. A realistic-looking Grim Reaper robe with a black screen over the face, with red glowing eyes, and a plastic bloody sheath. Quinn's neighborhood was swamped with kids from my school, and soon we had gone through almost the entire neighborhood, with our bags really weighing us down. It was getting late, but Quinn wanted us to continue on, and Austin and I were in no rush to go home, so we agreed, despite how dark it was getting. Quinn had told us that there was a shortcut to the other neighborhood through his backyard if we went down the hill and then through the trees for a while. Now, that kind of freaked me out, but being the only girl, I wasn't about to let on that I was scared. So I gulped when this was suggested, but nodded my approval, and off we went. Quinn had taken off his mask to better see as we stumbled down Quinn's backyard and decides to leave his sheath behind. We start through the woods and within about five minutes of walking and joking, we all then realized that none of us had thought to bring a flashlight. But it was fall so there were no leaves on the trees and light from the moon really helped to light up the way, if only enough not to walk into a tree. Austin asks how much longer and I can tell by the hitch in his voice that he likes this shortcut just about as much as I do. Before Quinn can answer, we hear a crunch from somewhere up ahead of us and we all freeze as Quinn sticks up a hand in the air to silence us. Did you guys hear that? Quinn says. I remain silent, but Austin snorts and replies. Stop it, Quinn. That's not going to work. You're not going to scare us. Quinn gasps and then says, I'm not joking. I really thought I heard something. And before I can tell them both just to keep walking, a shape in the darkness catches my eyes. It's up ahead of us, maybe 20 feet. It's dark, so I can't really distinguish anything, but it's only a moment later that no guessing is needed. Well, hey there, boys, came a strange man's reply from the spot. Quinn and Austin turn in horror as the man continues to walk towards us. What? Uh, who are you? stammers Quinn. With this, a deep laugh bellows out of the man. Oh, me? I'm the devil. This whole time he's walking closer to us, but in the silhouette of darkness, I see no signs of this man wearing a costume. No horns or anything. Th this is my property. What are you doing in the woods? Quinn demands, sounding less brave with each syllable. Oh, me? Ah, uh, I'm just out for a stroll. I don't really get out nearly as often as I'd like. He responds smoothly. Now he's about ten feet from us, halfway picking out from behind a tree. Quinn, let's just get out of here, I say. But Quinn, in a moment of bravery or stupidity, which is debatable, yells out to the man. What the hell's wrong with you? Stop talking to us. We're just trying to get through. And with that... Quinn nudges Austin and I and begins making a wide turn around the man, who silently watches us and spins around the tree with just his head and hands sticking out to watch us as we walk past. Austin then says to me, It's Halloween. He's just trying to scare us. I don't respond. Just keep my eyes locked on the man. He then yells, I hope I haven't scared you boys. I just really like your costumes. Why don't you come closer and let me have a better look? Immediately that comment sent up red flags to me, because you couldn't tell what Austin was, especially at a distance, and with Quinn's hood and sheath gone, you couldn't tell what he was either. That left me, and I didn't like that. Hey you, boy with the wings, come over here. Let me help you fly. And with that, he just started laughing again. Now, I had been getting bullied for how short my hair was, and Quinn and Austin knew how much it hurt me every time I was mistaken for a boy, so they had taken up to sticking up for me, and unfortunately, tonight was no exception. Hey, stop talking to her, you creep! Austin yelled, and with that, he picked up a rock and threw it at the man. It bounced off the tree where the man was half-covered, 
and the man suddenly did a creepy little half jump half dance and clapped his hands. Uh, her? You're a girl? That's even better. And with that, he much like a wild animal bounded forward, hands first on all fours. I immediately dropped my candy and all three of us began screaming our heads off and running. I don't think he chased us long, but with the crunching under our feet and our screams, it was pretty much impossible to tell. I quickly had to abandon my wings too, as they continued to get stuck to branches as we weaved through the trees in pure terror. We didn't stop until we made it through the trees and onto a well-lit street, though there were very few kids out at this point anyway. We were now over 15 minutes away from Quinn's house and probably an hour plus walk back to my house, and it was only getting later. Quinn had dropped his bag too, only Austin kept his, clutching it like it were a child. We took the long lit way back to Quinn's house in almost complete silence, terrified the man would appear again, but he didn't. When we actually made it, we frantically explained what happened, and though sympathetic, Quinn's mom said we couldn't call the police. She said that nothing had happened and we had no description of the man and that it was Halloween. The man was probably long gone and also was almost definitely just trying to scare us. She drove Austin and I home and I ended up getting grounded for being out so late and also leaving my costume behind. I didn't even bother to explain what had happened and she didn't seem to notice that I had no candy. The next day, though, I couldn't go out because I was grounded. Quinn came over with his mom and gave me a bag of candy that they had bought because he knew I had lost mine in the woods. We never talked about it again after that, all convincing ourselves that it was probably just some creepy Halloween prank that went too far. So did the devil or whoever you are. I really, really hope to never see you again, and especially on Halloween. The story happened to my brother, and it's told from his perspective. On Halloween of 2017, I went trick-or-treating with my friends, who I'll call Harvey, Michael, and Daniel. We were all around 14 to 15 years old, and really just wanted to make the most of this Halloween, as we would have had so much homework starting the 10th grade, and we'd probably never be able to trick-or-treat again. Anyway, we were walking down this random street at like 9.30, when we saw this one house with like really insane over-the-top Halloween decorations that looked like they cost up to $500. The four of us walked up to the house and we rang the bell. Some 50-year-old guy opened the door and then said, No need to yell. Just come in and you'll get your sweets. Daniel told the guy, Uh, can't you just bring the candy out here? The guy didn't even answer, so the four of us just walked away, not saying a single word. But of course, the story wouldn't be scary if it ended here. We were walking down my street when Harvey pointed out, Guys, I think that man is following us. We all looked behind us and we saw that same 50-year-old man walking about 25 feet behind us. The four of us then bolted all the way down to my house. We were all way too scared to even think about revealing where I lived to this psycho. We thrust open the front door, entered my house, and locked the door. The four of us were just hyperventilating, as if we had just run like a 75 mile marathon. I was starting to calm down when Michael then said, Dude, look at the window. We all looked, and there he was. The old man was looking through one of my windows. My parents were on vacation at the time, and my older brother was at his friend's Halloween party, so we couldn't tell them. But what really made this horrifying was I could see the guy holding a Saturday night special in his hand. We all ran upstairs and called the police. The officers arrived in 10 minutes. The man wasn't on my property anymore, but we remembered the house he was in. The cops went there, searched the whole place, and then came out with the man in chains. As it turns out, the house was vacant and the man was a serial killer who had escaped prison a month ago. If my friends and I are ever able to go trick-or-treating again, we're definitely avoiding the street that house is on. And who really knows what the guy would have really wanted to do to my friends and I had we been naive enough to enter that house. I will say though, I'm really glad this happened when we were teenagers and not like 9 years old. All I can say is if you're trick-or-treating, 
Make sure the house owner is completely normal. And if a single thing seems off in the slightest, just walk away. The scariest thing that ever happened to me on Halloween was back when I was living in Liverpool for university. Halloween is always a big night for students, as is any yearly event that involves dressing up and getting absolutely wasted. But since Halloween is a really good excuse to wear considerably less clothes than usual, party-oriented students tend to get particularly excited about it. So I'm in second year at this point, living with a bunch of my student mates just off Smithton Road, which is where loads of students can get shared houses for really cheap rent. We heard that this big house party was happening just down the road from us, one of those that had its own little Facebook events page set up to keep track of people directions to the house. I remember my mates sitting around the kitchen table, all staring at the screen as they went through all the profiles of girls they said that were attending. I mean, some of them were absolutely gorgeous, so we were all definitely hyped about it. Only just a few days before Halloween, I started to feel really, really grim. I had the shakes, I was running to and from the toilet every half an hour to erupt from both ends, and I could barely keep any food down. This persisted for like 48 hours straight, and thankfully it had abated by Halloween itself, but I still felt way too rough to do any serious partying. The last thing I wanted was to end up browning myself in front of like half the girls at our uni. I mean, every lad wants to be a legend, don't they, but for the right reasons. So anyway, on the day of the house party, despite my mates insisting I make an appearance and throw together a costume, I had made the firm decision to stay at home and chill for the evening. As much as I felt like I'm missing out, I just didn't feel up to it. So about seven-ish, my mates are pre-drinking in the kitchen, while I'm up in my room looking to order the spiciest curry I could get my hands on, in the hopes that it would purge the rest of the sickness out of me, so I could start the following week feeling fresh again. So about the time I'm burning my face off with a little chicken vindaloo, my mates are just about to head off down to the house party for a night of debauchery. There are a few final pleas for me to join them, but these are all violently rebuked. There might have been a chance of me joining them before the curry, but afterwards, no chance. I was in a full-on food coma. So a couple of hours later, I'm just chilling on the couch and wondering why British Netflix had such a dire collection of horror films when there's a knock at our front door. My first thought is that there's been some kind of puke-related disaster and one of the lads had to come back to get a change of clothes before heading back to the house party. I mean, this wasn't entirely out of the question, since the house party was only around the corner, safe staggering distance for anyone that had drank too much too quickly. But it then occurred to me that there was a chance it could have been trick-or-treaters. Smithen has a big mix of residential and student housing, so there was also a decent chance it could have been kids looking for sweets. So to save the house getting egged, I legged it into the kitchen and grabbed a few bits from the cupboards to offer any potential trick-or-treaters. But when I answered the door, Mars bars in hand, there was no one there. Maybe I'd just taken too long grabbing sweets or... Maybe it was just some knock-and-run type deal. But either way, there was no one to be seen. So I just head back inside, plonk myself down on the couch, and get back to digesting a ton of curry that I'd just eaten. A short while later, I'm still watching Netflix, about ready to doze off when something in the corner of the living room catches my eye. You know when you're so used to looking at a certain something that just the oddest little difference catches your eye? Well... I happened to notice that there was a little less of the orange streetlights outside coming through the little crack between the curtains and the window. Like this dark shape was outside, standing at the window. I sit up all nervous and it disappears from view, allowing me to see the orange light illuminating the street once again. Someone had been watching me. I got up, rushed to the cupboard under the stairs to grab my housemate's cricket bat, then edged toward the front door. I threw it open, ready to swing at whatever was out there, but again, there was nothing. I started to feel like I was going mental at that point, that maybe I was just exhausted from being sick for most of the week. I hadn't slept very well at all during the few days prior to Halloween, and I tried to reassure myself that maybe I was just a wee bit jumpy from being overtired. I decided it was best that I get an early night, 
telling myself that I'd feel much better in the morning. I did a bit of washing up, got a shower, then put on some comfy clothes to get ready for bed, but just as I do, there's another knock on the door. Only this time I can clearly hear some young sounding voice go trick or treat from the other side of the door. I'd almost jumped out of my skin when I heard the door go, but the voice was weirdly reassuring. I mean, it was only trick or treaters, right? The worst that could happen was I got a few eggs thrown at me or some toilet paper lashed over the house. I walked downstairs, grabbed the handful of Mars bars I'd fished out of the cupboard, then opened up the front door. I was expecting to see a gaggle of school-aged kids, maybe accompanied by an adult supervising them, but there was just one smallish-looking figure stood in the pathway of our shared house. They couldn't have been any older than a teenager, but they definitely looked a little bit too old to be trick-or-treating. I don't imagine that they'd been particularly intimidating otherwise, but the mask they were wearing seriously gave me the creeps. It looked old, like it smelled like disgusting unwashed latex on the inside. I'm not even sure it was meant to be a Halloween mask at all. It was like an old man's face with these tiny black eyes and a big white smile stretching from ear to ear. I made some derisive comment to him like, aren't you a bit too old to be trick-or-treating? But held the handful of Mars bars out towards him anyway. I reckoned he'd just tell me to bugger off and snatch the sweets off me and leg it down the path, but he didn't. The lad just stood there, looking at me from behind the mask, not even moving to take the chocolate bars off me. I asked him if he was alright, starting to actually get creeped out by his behavior on top of the weird old mask he was wearing, but still he didn't say anything. There was something intensely creepy about not being able to see his actual eyes behind that mask, and the longer we stood there in silence, just staring at each other, the more I felt myself begin to tense up. Then right as I'm about to just give him an awkward goodbye and shut the door, I hear a loud noise coming from behind me. I didn't really think the situation through, I just reacted, running into the kitchen at the back of the house where the noise was coming from, just in time to see someone smash the back door open. About three or four people then pour into the kitchen, all wearing masks, some armed with bats, others with these big knives in their hands. I turn around and leg it back towards the front door, planning on running upstairs to my room where my phone was charging to bring the police. But to my absolute horror, blocking the way to the stairs was the little lad with the mask on. Only this time, he had a knife in his hand too. He'd been in on this whole thing that whole time, and as he pointed the knife in my direction, all I could do was raise my hands in this please-don't-stab-me type of way. Get on the floor, he said, in this voice that seriously sounded like he was no older than about 14. Like he legit sounded like a kid, and that scared me even more. A grown man might have the presence of mind to not hurt anyone and keep the severity of their crimes to a minimum, but a kid... I thought he might just stab me up for the fun of it. I'd heard stories about gangs all over the world making younger kids commit violence to just sort of prove themselves, and that's what had me shaking as I lay down on the carpeted floor in the hallway, face down with my hands on the back of my head. I listened as the gang just completely ransacked the house. I couldn't see exactly what they were taking, but I heard them mentioning laptops and phones a fair bit laughing to themselves as they absolutely raided each and every room in the house. At some points I heard smashing and crashing noises as they just took it upon themselves to commit as much wanton destruction as they liked, giggling maniacally to each other as they realized they had the time and freedom to do pretty much whatever they fancied. I thought if I just lay there, keeping still and quiet, that they'd leave me alone, but that was just wishful thinking on my part. Obviously, they had to make their way through the hallway a fair few times, and when they did, they'd either literally walk all over me, which was painful enough, or they'd get in a few kicks here and there just to hear me grimace. I think the worst part of the physical abuse was when I heard one of them say, Kick him in the balls, lad, to one of their mates. I tried to shut my legs, but they still aimed a few kicks between my thighs. Luckily, I was kind of tucked up, if you know what I mean, and there wasn't anything too delicate exposed, but still, 
The idea of getting my bollocks crushed under the trainer of some disgusting little thug had my heart practically jumping out of my throat. It sort of reminded me of that scene from A Clockwork Orange. They were there to rob us. That was bloody obvious, but they clearly took a great deal of joy in just being able to terrorize someone for a bit, and they seemed to get a real kick out of realizing that I wasn't from Liverpool. At some point I said something like, Just take what you want. Please don't hurt me. And they burst out laughing. I wouldn't say I'm posh by any stretch of the imagination, but I'd definitely say I'm well more spoken than your average scouser. They started mimicking me in these little voices, stamping on my head and kicking me. I just lay there, wishing I'd never said anything. After what seemed like forever, listening to those kids ferrying out belongings into the alley behind the house, they finally left. But not before putting one of their knives to my throat and telling me that they'd be back to cut my head off if they so much as even saw a police officer in the area. Then as quickly as they'd all appeared, they just ghosted. I waited for a long time before I found it in me to stand up, and as I tried, my knees were way shakier than I'd care to admit. I went from room to room surveying the destruction. The place was a mess. But the thing that amazed and gutted me more than anything else was the sheer amount of stuff they'd taken. God knows how they'd got it all away from the house, but they'd taken the TVs, our game consoles, audio equipment, pretty much anything electrical that wasn't nailed down. It also looked like they'd taken pretty much all our trainers and had raided our closets for any clothes that took their liking. I wanted to call the police, really did, but with what phone? I'm almost glad I got a few kicks to the head, otherwise the sense of shame and humiliation might have been too much to bear. I ended up knocking at my neighbor's houses, but unlike me, they were way too smart to answer their doors to strangers on Halloween. It was probably the single worst experience of my life up to that point. I had to just go back inside the house and sit there in the living room couch with my head in my hands, just trying not to hold back tears. It was hours before any of my drunken housemates arrived back. Before that, I think I just sort of sat there at the kitchen table in the one room that hadn't been completely ransacked, just drinking a few tins of lager, feeling absolutely shell-shocked, until finally two of them who hadn't polled returned home. And that's about the end of it. There's no real resolution to the story. The police couldn't do anything other than take down a list of what had been stolen in the hopes that any of the laptops turned up in pawn shops, but we never heard back about anything involving that. It was weird in that house for a long while after. I used to think the other lads blamed me for what happened for not defending the house property, but I realized that was just the trauma from that night making me doubt myself. I had nightmares for a while, a long while actually, and in the end my parents paid for a few counseling sessions to help me get through my skull that... What happened that night really wasn't my fault, how it could have happened to anyone. I got past it in time, but to this day, it remains the single most terrifying event of my entire life. When I was 21, I lived with my two friends, Bruce and Ollie. We lived in a small house in a nice family-friendly neighborhood in the suburbs of our major city. Ollie owned the house and occupied the master bedroom on the main floor, and Bruce had the other bedroom on the main floor. My bedroom was on the mostly finished basement, which was great because I had a ton of privacy and a lot of open space. There was a side door that could be accessed from the basement so I could come and go as I pleased without bothering the other roommates. We were all pretty close, but it was nice to feel like I had my own living space even though there were three of us in the house. At the time, Bruce and I were huge fans of Halloween and the fall season in general, but being adults and having full-time jobs, it wasn't really ideal for us to go out and attend Halloween parties like a lot of the other people we knew. Also, Halloween fell on a Tuesday this year, so instead we decided to just watch some horror movies in my basement bedroom and just hang out and relax. After we watched a couple of movies, we started to get a little bored. It was about 11pm and the trick-or-treaters were home and most people were in for the night. Knowing we had to work in the AM, we decided it would be a good idea for us to go on a quick walk and call it a night. 
There is something about the air on Halloween night. It's like when you go on a vacation to Florida and the night breeze just feels and smells different. That's how it is on Halloween. It's nostalgic and can almost give you a euphoric feeling. Anyway, as we started to walk in the quiet and somewhat desolate neighborhood, we approached the park. Now we walk through this park all the time during the day, probably at least 50 times at this point. It was a little park right in the middle of the neighborhood. The park had a main entrance from one of the busier streets and a back entrance from the street we lived on. The back entrance was covered with a lot of trees and a very small wooded area. About 30 yards from the entrance, there were three baseball fields, a pavilion, and a basketball court. We walked into the back entrance where all the trees were and it was nearly pitch black, but there was a low orange hue from the streetlight barely making its way through the trees. As we walked through the wooded area, we both stopped abruptly. We thought we saw a man standing at the end of the path. The figure was completely still, and it was so dark we couldn't be sure what it was. I called out, Hey! to the figure, but no response. I suggested we should turn around, but Bruce said we should check it out, which was unlike him because I was usually the braver of us too. As we got closer, it was clear it was a man standing there. The man was completely still and had both of his hands in his front hoodie pocket. His head was down facing the ground. Trying not to freak out, we decided to slowly back up and make our way to the street and our house without further confrontation. Before we even moved, we heard a noise next to us coming from both sides. Trying to focus our eyes in the darkness, we saw two more figures moving towards us in the woods. Unlike the other guy just standing there, these people were approaching us. I wish I could explain the feeling I felt inside me during this point. It's like the sinking pit in your stomach when a cop pulls up behind you with his lights on, but 100 times worse. Fight or flight kicked in and we turned and sprinted full speed out of that park and onto our street, never looking back to see if they were following us. We ran right to our house and locked the doors behind us. While sitting in the basement, we had all the lights off and we were trying to look out the basement windows to see if we could see if anyone followed us or possibly saw the house we went into. We were so scared we didn't know what to do. Were we in real danger? Was it someone just playing a prank? After about half an hour or so, we decided that they most likely didn't follow us and it was probably okay to go to sleep, especially considering we both had work in the morning. At about 2.30 in the morning, Bruce woke me up. He said he thought he heard something outside his bedroom window. I went to his room and looked out the window and I could see a pumpkin laying in our backyard. This was concerning because we didn't have any pumpkins outside our house. We didn't set any up for decorations or anything like that. For the second time tonight, we were terrified and decided to go into the living room. While in the living room, we made sure we had the house lights off and began looking out the front windows. Within the first minute of looking... There they were, three men standing in the middle of the road just staring at our house. We thought about calling the police, but what were we going to tell them? There are three guys not standing on our property who may or may not have thrown a pumpkin in our backyard. We just sat in the living room for about ten minutes trying to think of something, anything we could do. We made sure the front door was locked and grabbed a baseball bat and I think a kitchen knife. We looked out the window again and the three men were gone. Nothing but the illumination from the street lights. For the rest of the night, we stayed in the living room watching Sports Center until we eventually dozed off. Morning finally came. As we got ready for work, we just agreed it was probably just a Halloween prank and we should move on and forget about it. However, when I got to my car, there was a note on my windshield that said, Happy Halloween, with a smiling face sticker on it. What I read next gave me the same feeling I had just had a few hours before when I thought we were in real danger. At the bottom on the paper it said, P.S. Good thing you lock your doors. What would these people have done if the doors were unlocked? Bruce and I both decided to call in from work and stay home that day. Nothing else of note happened regarding this incident, but it's just a reminder that it doesn't matter how quiet and nice a neighborhood you think you live in. On Halloween, anything can happen.
As we slowly enter the fall season, I'd like to share a story with you that happened to me a few years ago. I have mentioned this story to some of my close personal friends and family, many of which don't believe me, and that's fine. They probably think I'm just joking around or trying to scare them, but I know I experienced something that night and I wish I had a better explanation for it. At the time these events took place, I lived on a quiet street a little outside the city, but not quite into the suburbs. My street had a big rundown house at the very end of the block that was across from an unused parking lot and an out-of-business bar. The person who inhabited the house before it became dilapidated was Mrs. Morgan. Mrs. Morgan was an old curmudgeon in every sense of the word. Every time my friends and I would walk by the house, she would yell at us and make some insanely random comment like we were trampling her garden or using her garbage to play hide and seek or some other incoherent nonsense that wasn't true. Even though my friends and I did get into some adolescence trouble around the neighborhood, we never did anything to Mrs. Morgan. Our parents always told us that we should try and be nice. I mean, she was a widow and had no children, so it must have been a pretty lonely life. Rewind about three years ago when Mrs. Morgan unfortunately passes away, and the house becomes abandoned and, I believe, eventually condemned. At least there were signs on the boarded up windows and doors, but I never got close enough to read what they said. Needless to say, it became an eyesore for the community in what was a pretty quiet and uneventful street. My girlfriend at the time only lived a couple of blocks and I would usually walk to and from her house when we hung out. It was literally a four minute walk top so it was no big deal. I would pass Mrs. Morgan's abandoned house and the empty parking lot with the out of business bar every time I walked to and from her house. Now fast forward to a few years ago, the last time I ever made that walk. It was about 3am on Halloween night, I guess technically November 1st and I was walking home from my girlfriend's house. I was supposed to be home way earlier in the night, but we both fell asleep watching scary movies and pigging out on the extra candy her parents didn't hand out. As I made it to my street and started my walk past Mrs. Morgan's house, I heard a noise. I stopped for a minute to make sure it wasn't a skunk because for some odd reason that's the first thing that popped in my mind when I heard the noise. I slowed down a little bit and looked at the house as I proceeded cautiously. That's when I noticed the front door that was usually boarded up and had a sign posted on it was now open. I tried to rationalize why the door was now open, saying to myself it was probably the wind, but then again, it was a beautiful calm night. I then paused in front of the house and looked directly at the front door, and that's when I saw her, Mrs. Morgan, right there, staring back at me. I knew for sure it was her, but how? She had passed away and the house was clearly unlivable for anyone else. At this point, I was so scared that I just shouted something out. I don't even remember if it was words or just noises. The figure stepped onto the front porch and continued to stare at me. I broke my stare and just started running back to my house, turning back every now and then to see if she was still staring at me or perhaps following me. I made it back to my house probably 30 seconds later and opened the side door and went down to my room. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I'm not sure if I was overtired or just had scary things in my subconscious with it being Halloween and watching movies all night, but I know I saw Mrs. Morgan standing there only a couple of feet away from me. Whether it was a true paranormal encounter or something that my mind made me think I saw, I will never know for sure. But hey, they always say that the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest on Halloween, and now I actually believe it. Alright, so you guys might not find this creepy or scary enough, but I thought it was worth sharing. This is something that I experienced when I was a kid, probably between the ages of 10 to 14. Our Halloween tradition was that my parents and I would meet up with my godparents and their son and go trick-or-treating around our neighborhood. This has been a tradition with my older siblings as well, so it's fair to say this tradition has started even before I was born. Anyway, we follow the same route every year, the highlight being stopping at the local funeral home that was only about three blocks from my house. The funeral home had a big party in their parking lot every Halloween. They provided cotton candy, candy apples, donuts, cider, popcorn, 
balloons, and probably even more, all free. If you wanted a balloon, which every kid did, you had to shake the hand of the person in the full-on movie set quality gorilla suit. I hated doing it because the gorilla shook your hand so hard I borderline thought my hand was going to break. So, every year it was the same thing. If you wanted a balloon, you had to shake his hand. I developed kind of an anxiety as it related to the gorilla, so I would just grab the snacks to avoid the person in the gorilla costume. Also, I was getting older and I really didn't care about balloons. But it seemed as though the gorilla would follow me around and put a balloon out in his right hand like he wanted me to take it. I tried my best just to avoid it and hurry my parents on so we could continue trick-or-treating. They thought it was the funniest thing that I was scared of the gorilla. I really don't think I was. I think I just thought it was weird that a grown man dressed in a costume would shatter kids' hands in order to give them a balloon. So this story revolves around one Halloween where we followed the same routine as previously mentioned. I ignored the person in the gorilla costume when it came to that part of the night and had a pretty uneventful night trick-or-treating. I remember I was still at the age where I had a bedtime and my parents had to check my candy. Yes, they were those parents. I was still impressionable enough that horror movies scared the crap out of me and I couldn't even watch them because then I couldn't sleep with the lights off. For whatever reason that night I felt particularly uneasy and scared. I had avoided scary movies so I could get a good night's sleep, but for some reason I was unsettled. I ended up sleeping on the floor with my chocolate lab and my dad passed out on the couch, which gave me some sense of relief. I got up in the middle of the night to let my dog out. I knew she had to go out because she was pacing back and forth. She was quick and came right back in, but on the way back to the living room I saw something in the street. It was a figure that seemed to be just standing there. I crept up to the window on my knees to get a better look so I couldn't be seen. I swear to God it was that gorilla holding the balloons, literally standing right outside my house. I didn't know what to do. I was scared, but more scared that this person was going to approach my house. I woke up my dad who was snoring so loud I was surprised the neighbors weren't awake. I told him there was someone outside and he got up immediately and opened the front door but there was no one in the street no one around at all, at least that he could see. I told him what I thought I saw and he said it was probably just a bad dream or my imagination. We turned the TV on in the living room for a while because I think he could tell I was unsettled and was having trouble trying to fall back asleep. I can sit here today writing this and honestly tell you, I don't know what happened. I never had any other episodes where I thought I saw something that wasn't there. I don't sleepwalk. I don't often have nightmares. I don't know how to explain what I saw. It was a long time ago and now I'm an adult who takes his own niece and nephew trick-or-treating, but every time around fall I always think about this experience and try to come to a logical conclusion to explain what happened. I still can't figure it out and probably never will. I wonder if that funeral home is still open and if the guy in the gorilla costume is still there. Let me start this story by saying I have only shared this story with a few people up to this point. I trusted a few close friends who I thought would believe me, but that's about it. I can remember the events of this specific night vividly. My parents own a camp on a local lake about 25 minutes from my hometown. It's pretty awesome to go there, bring friends, and basically do what we want. My friends and I would usually throw smaller parties out there all summer long. There was always activity on the lake, but nothing that really ever raised any alarms. We kind of just chalked it up to either boats, wind, or animals if we thought we saw something in the lake after it got dark. One Halloween night, I decided it would be a good idea to skip the Halloween party that was taking place in town and bring my boyfriend back to the camp house for the night so we could be alone. My parents thought I would be at said Halloween party and would be spending the night at a friend's house. We arrived at the camp pretty late around 9 or 10 p.m. One thing I remember about the camp is how dark it was, void of any street lights and usually only illuminated by the stars in the sky. My boyfriend and I stayed up for a couple of hours talking, eating, and I think we played a board game or something like that. I would guess we fell asleep at some point after midnight. 
After about an hour or so of sleeping, I woke up suddenly to what seemed to be a loud blast, like a gunshot but distorted somehow. I just remember it being so loud that I couldn't even remember where I was when I woke up. I looked over the couch and my boyfriend was somehow still asleep. I got up and looked out the back door window which had a view of the lake. I saw something that looked like a light or a ball of light over the lake. I stared at the floating light in confusion trying to figure out what it was. Was it a flashlight or something glowing from under the water? Without really thinking, I slipped on my flip-flops and I went outside and approached the shore, still staring at the light, squinting my eyes trying to make out what it was. It was an orange-colored light, maybe 75 feet out into the lake and what seemed to be floating a couple of feet off the top of the water. After about two minutes of continued staring and squinting, the orange color changed to a bright purple, and several white specks of light came out of the purple glow and hovered all around the glowing orb. As I started to freak out as to what this could be, I was forced to my knees by the loud blasting noise I heard earlier. I started to plug my ears, collect myself, and turn back to the house to grab my boyfriend. I saw a huge flash and the next thing I remember was waking up in Adirondack chair on my neighbor's yard the next morning. My flip flops that I wore outside to get a closer look at the lake were gone. I had no idea how to explain the events of the night and long story short, I went to the doctor and after seeing neurological specialists, they don't show any sign that I could have had an episode. I've been told that it was most likely a vivid nightmare and that I was sleepwalking and that's how I ended up on my neighbor's porch. Also, that would explain why my boyfriend never woke up. However, I believe this night I saw something otherworldly. I don't believe in the paranormal and until this point, I didn't believe in the extraterrestrial. But this didn't feel like a nightmare. It felt real. I can still see the images and hear the noises from that night. I know many of you may not believe my story and that's fine but I feel like I wanted to share the experience I had that night. I'm no longer with that boyfriend, and even though he was concerned for my well-being, especially immediately after the events, I don't think he really believed my story either. Needless to say, I spend less time at the camp and am reminded of this night every year around this time, when Halloween decorations start popping up in the stores. The events of this story took place when I was 18 and in my senior year of high school. I'm 27 now and still have horrible flashbacks from that Halloween night. My friends and I liked to party in high school, and Halloween was obviously one of the best nights to go out and party. We got to dress up in sexy outfits and have an excuse to act a little crazy. My friends usually drew all the attention from the guys we went to school with. I was still friends with all the boys, but none of them really ever showed any interest outside of friendship. Anyway, on this particular Halloween, we had a party at my friend Steve's house. Like a lot of high school parties, no one knew how to handle their alcohol. At about 11, the cops had already been called for a noise complaint. The party scattered and everyone ran as to not get detained or get their information taken by police. My friend Amy, who was getting into a car with her boyfriend, told me to jump into the car with her friend Dave, and he would take us to another party, which I begrudgingly decided to do. The car ride was weird. Just him and I who didn't know each other and didn't really have much to say. Awkward. The car smelled like Slim Jims and body odor and looked rather messy. Dave had a mask which was on his lap while he was driving. He had a hooded sweatshirt, blue jeans and brown work boots on to complete the costume. He also had a scraggly beard and greasy hair. I tried asking questions to make the drive less awkward but... He didn't really answer them and didn't seem interested in holding a conversation. Finally, I asked what school he went to and he responded, I dropped out of college a year ago. So I asked, well, how old are you? He responded in a shaky, almost nervous voice, I I'm 25. This freaked me out a little bit because he was older than me and he just dropped out of college at the age of 25. Also, he was 25 and was just leaving a high school party. Trying not to let him in on the fact that I was kind of nervous, I asked, So, how do you know Amy? 
and he responded in his shaky and unflattering voice, he said, Who, who, who's Amy? I sunk into my seat, pinching my sides, not knowing what to do. She's the blonde who told me to get in the car with you. He responded with a very stoic, Oh, her. Yeah. She told me you were single. I didn't respond. I honestly didn't know what to say. Did this guy really not know Amy? Or was he just tipsy and confused? I texted Amy as we were driving to tell her how angry I was, but she didn't answer. About 10 or 15 minutes in the car, which seemed like forever, we arrived at a house. It didn't seem to be a very nice part of town, or at least an area I was accustomed to going to parties. I looked for Amy's car, or any car I recognized, but it was just too dark to point anything out. We approached a red door with chipped paint lit up only by a dull front light. Dave didn't even knock and just walked into the house, so I followed him, hoping to see a familiar face. The house was cold and smelled awful. We walked into the front room, which I assumed would be the living room. It was dirty and had an olive green shag carpet with an old brown couch. The walls were white with chipped paint and stains everywhere. Piles of pizza boxes and beer cans lined the floors. The room was only lit by one lamp that was on the floor and it gave off a very low light. On the brown couch there was a man and woman sitting very close together but not really moving. They looked to be passed out or maybe just drunk. We walked into the kitchen which was just more of the same. Trash and that horrid smell of garbage. In the kitchen there was a man probably in his 20s who looked like he may have been using. He gave Dave a high five and introduced himself to me as Skip. He looked at Dave and back at me and smiled. His yellow teeth and bug eyes made my skin crawl. The other man in the kitchen was an older gentleman maybe in his 40s or 50s, I couldn't tell. He said nothing and just looked at me. I felt sick to my stomach and the only reason why I didn't run out of this place was because I had no clue where I was and had no clue if these people were capable of anything dangerous. Again, I texted Amy with no answer, deciding to not call as my phone only had 5% battery. Dave escorted me into the back room, which was kind of like a screened-in porch. I felt a brief moment of relief seeing about six or seven people out there. There were only two girls out of the bunch, and they were half-naked and looked like they weighed a maximum of 90 pounds. I could feel everybody staring at me, but at least there was a group of people and I wasn't secluded or alone with this Dave. I know it sounds crazy, but I felt almost safe being around this larger crowd, but this temporary relief faded very quickly when the two girls left with all the guys who had been on the porch. They re-entered the house and disappeared out of sight. As I sat in this screened-in room trying to think of my options, Dave finally spoke up and said, I think you're really cute. I said thanks and kind of shrugged it off. He got up and started to rub my back and began breathing very heavily. After about five minutes of the most unpleasant back rub I had ever had, he stepped in front of me and asked if I wanted to go somewhere more private. I said to him in a terrified, cracking voice, I I'm sorry, but I'm not that kind of girl. I could see the displeasure and anger in his face, and I could feel the tears coming. Then nothing short of a miracle happened. One of the girls who went inside just a minute before began to scream erratically, swearing and yelling at everyone in the room. Dave ran upstairs leaving me downstairs in the back room alone, and without even thinking twice I got up and climbed out the window and ran. I didn't care that I didn't know where I was, I wasn't going to stop until I was to a gas station or a 7-Eleven or something. I was running down the street staying close to the sidewalk trying not to bring any attention to myself. After what seemed like a few minutes, I luckily approached a 24-hour Walmart. I walked in and had the night manager call my parents as my cell phone was now dead. It was about 30 minutes from my house and my parents were on their way. Just as I thought I could relax and try to put these horrifying events behind me, Dave and his friend Skip walked into the Walmart. They didn't see me, but I couldn't believe that they were in the same store. They were looking around like they were looking for something or someone. Was it me or was I being paranoid? The next day Amy called me and apologized all day crying and asking what she could do to make it up to me. 
I got some solace that she confirmed the person I got into the car with was actually Dave and not some random guy, but was still left traumatized thinking about what could have happened. It's been almost 10 years since that night and I know it could have been a lot worse, and I'm lucky that I was able to leave with no physical harm, but still wouldn't wish the experience I had that night on my worst enemy. I haven't seen Dave, Skip, or any of the people I saw that night, and hope I never do again. I'm 27 years old now. This happened when I was 13, my sister was 9, and my brother was 6. We were raised by our single mother. She usually worked nights on the weekends. I was old enough to be home alone, so whenever my mom was at work, I was the one responsible for my siblings. This all happened on a Saturday night. For a little bit of context, let me give you the layout of my childhood home. When you walked into the living room, there was a hallway. To the right was the kitchen, then straight ahead was the downstairs bathroom. To the left was the stairway. Once you got upstairs, the first room straight ahead was the upstairs bathroom. The first room on the right was my room, and the second room on the right was my brother's. The room across from mine was my mom's, and my sister's room was right next to my mom's. Now here's the story. Before my mom left for work, she had gave me $20 for pizza, then left. I ordered the pizza and we had a good night. About two hours after we ate, my sister went to the downstairs bathroom. When she came out of the bathroom though, she said that she heard someone knock on the window. I believed her and I told her that it was okay. Well, about an hour later, we heard yet another knock at the front door. I looked in the people, and I saw a dirty looking man with long brown scraggly hair. He looked like he was homeless, but I couldn't really tell. I then began to look down, and I saw that he had a knife right in his hand. I then looked at my brother, and I told him to turn off the TV and all of the lamps. I told my sister to grab my flip phone while I ran in the kitchen to grab a knife. I then told all of my siblings to go upstairs. I told my brother to go hide under his bed and my sister to go hide in my mom's closet. I then hid in the upstairs bathtub. I then heard the front door smash open. It was a really flimsy old door so it didn't really surprise me that that happened. I then heard doors opening downstairs. I started to dial 911. I heard the man start to come upstairs and then heard the bathroom door open. I held one hand over my mouth while the other was holding my flip phone. Very luckily, he didn't open the shower curtain. When the man left, I had started to worry about my siblings. I then got out of the bathtub and ran out of the bathroom. I began to run full force at the guy, stabbing him a few times. Right as this was happening, the police had finally arrived. I saw him trying to run out the front door, but the police were able to catch him. I then found my siblings, and the police called our mom. My mom came home immediately. She even quit that job because of this. So yeah, that's definitely the scariest thing that's ever happened to me while home alone, but hopefully the last. I'm currently a 15 year old female, but I was around 11 at the time of this event. It was mid-December in West Virginia, and there was a thin layer of snow on the ground, and I was home alone while my entire household was at the local Walmart. I didn't go because I had a terrible fever, but regardless of the fever, I typically stayed home anyway. I've always had some sort of social anxiety, and I've never really liked being in a crowd of people, with the fear that I'd be judged. Now starting the story, it had been about 15 minutes after my family left and I was sitting on my bed with my protective pit bull. Keep that in mind because it's a really important part of the story. I was watching some show on my laptop when out of the corner of my eye, I saw what looked like a human shape, then very quickly passed my window. I tried to brush it off while attempting to rationalize the incident, but I had a gut feeling that something was wrong. Disregarding my gut feeling, I directed my attention back to my show, when about five minutes later, 
My dog jumped off my bed and then started growling while looking in my window. I didn't really think too much of it at first, knowing that she often growled at deer when they passed my window. But then I thought about what I saw before, and then pretty much instantly, I felt my stomach go numb. I slowly walked up to my window to see if anything was there, and at first glance, I didn't see anything. Then my heart sank. I then looked across the snow and saw boot prints. Boot prints leading to my window. I was terrified at this point, scared to look down, but still, I slowly let my eyes venture downward, and to my horror, right below the window pressed up against my house, I saw a man. He was about six foot from what I could tell, with dark brown hair, a beard, and dark green eyes, and he was wearing a snowsuit. He then looked up at me, and the both of us were frozen in fear. We made eye contact for about ten seconds but that 10 seconds felt like forever. As soon as I snapped into realization, I grabbed my phone and ran as fast as I could up the stairs and then into my bathroom. I could still hear my dog growling and loudly barking, but I didn't care. I decided to call my mom. Stupid, I know. I should have called the police instead, but I was just so scared and the only thing making me feel safe was the sound of her voice. As soon as she picked up the phone, she heard how stressed I was and just how frightened my voice sounded. I explained the situation and she told me she was sending the police and that she would be heading home ASAP. Well, everything was starting to smooth out. Although I was still shook, I was feeling more comfort now. But then everything came crashing down when I then heard glass begin to shatter. I thought I was going to pass out. I was shaking so violently and I couldn't think straight. The next sound that followed up was a screaming, just very loud, blood-curdling screams. And that's when I realized it. My dog was attacking him. I was still so scared shitless, but felt a sense of happiness. Soon I heard my door being broken down while my mom and the police officers came into the house. My mom came up to the bathroom and I let her inside. I think I can honestly say that that was the most safe I'd ever felt in my mother's arms. She walked me downstairs and I could see the guy being taken out in handcuffs, crying and covered in blood. My dog then came barreling into me, licking my face and jumping all over me. I could tell right away that she knew she had done right. I still have the same dog. Her name is Metallic and she's 8 years old. She still acts like a puppy though. I will forever love that dog and she's probably the reason I'm here today. So, I'm a big horror fangirl. I'm 20 years old and over the past year, I've been collecting from the figures to the mask to even life size. I won't say this story was terrifying or anything, but to me, it basically saved me. I'll try and make it simple. I'm a big Michael Myers fan and last October I bought a life size figure of him. Oh, and a Chucky doll too. And not just one of the cheap ones, the replica looking ones. Some may call me crazy, but what's not to love about horror, right? I keep everything stored away at the moment, apart from the life-size Michael, which he stands around six foot. He's not a cheap-looking guy either. He looks like the real deal. The replica mask, real coveralls with blood, and even a knife too. He stands in my room right next to my bed, and even though it used to creep me out seeing a dark black figure in my room, I eventually got used to it like to the point where I actually felt comfortable around him. I don't move him anywhere else though, as nobody in the house really liked him. Anyway, now that that's all out of the way, here's the thing that happened. So last year when I received him, I was home alone watching films downstairs when I then heard a thud upstairs. I froze, as I didn't really know what to think. I slowly got up and went up to my room, and then instantly heard the thuds from the downstairs door. I had absolutely no clue what the hell was going on because I was the only one there. I quietly sat in the dark as I didn't keep the lights on, and I listened. I heard what sounded like men talking, and then I realized someone had came in and that I didn't lock the door. The TV was also left on, so they had to have known I was there. Anyways though, there I was sitting face to face with the Michael figure in the dark. 
I heard the footsteps coming up the stairs to my room while I sat in the corner with my head spinning. I felt like I wanted to pass out. I even started to sweat a little. My door then opened and there I'd seen a hooded figure walk in and head straight towards me. He had something in his hand, something sharp, like a pocket knife. I was leaning against the cold wall more and more, wanting to grab something, until out of nowhere, Michael's arm then started moving. Bear in mind, it was still dark, so this guy had no clue that Michael was behind him until he heard it move. I also want to add that it wasn't an electrical noise. It was the material of the arm rubbing together. The man then turned around and instantly yelled. And I mean, I've never seen a man run so fast in his life. The man then started yelling, Go! Get the hell out of here! To some other guy that was in a van outside. I stood up and watched them as they drove off. I then noticed a crack in my window. Obviously, these freaks were throwing rocks in my window, possibly to distract me, but I didn't care about that. I turned around and just stared at Michael because I really had no clue that he could even move. I started investigating and then realized he was an animatronic the entire time, but I was thinking he moved just at that exact moment and basically saved my life that night. I can even laugh about it now because of how scared the guy was. I got my window repaired and did mention to the police that I had a break in, but there was really nothing they could do about it, but it was still reported just in case they tried anywhere else. Luckily, nothing was taken, as there was really nothing valuable downstairs. Obviously, this Michael Myers looks like a real person, and anyone that looks at it, especially in the dark, gets the creeps by it. I know it sounds insane and maybe even funny, but this incident really happened, and I'm so damn thankful that I have him in my room. I never even once thought it would save my life like this, especially if he never moved. I always wonder how he moved anyway. I mean, it happened all by itself. Was it some kind of coincidence? I'll never know. But thank you, Michael. God only knows what that guy would have done to me if you weren't here. A little bit of context. I'm a 27-year-old female, and I live alone with my dog. I purchased my home in December of 2019, so I'm still a bit new to the neighborhood. My neighbor to the left of me is a sweet old man named Leo, and we really get along quite well. We were chatting one afternoon and he was giving me the inside scoop on all of the neighbors. He was the first house on the block, so he knows pretty much everything about everyone. When we got to talking about the man who lives on the right side of me, let's call him Tom. Well, Leo seemed to become hesitant. Leo then said, Well, you know that Tom was involved with that group that murdered that librarian, right? Obviously very confused, I told Leo that I wasn't really sure what he meant, and I asked him what happened. I'm not sure if Leo just regretted telling me in that moment, or if his hearing is just bad and he didn't hear my question. Regardless, he immediately changed the subject, and I didn't dare pressure him to elaborate. After our conversation, I thought about the little that I know about Tom. He's tall with graying hair and seems to keep to himself. When I first moved in, I was honestly a bit concerned for him because I never saw any lights on in his home. Every single blind was pulled down consistently and his old truck rarely ever left his driveway. He's also the only one on our street with a privacy fence surrounding his backyard total red flags looking back now. Later that night, I decided to do a bit of research, trying to figure out what Leo had mentioned. And well, it didn't really take long for me to stumble across the news article. One of the most gruesome murders in the county, it read. I read articles upon articles and full court documents all about the violent murder of a middle-aged woman. It turns out that when Tom was a young adult living in the next county over, he and his friend attempted to rob a neighbor by breaking into her home during the daytime, but she unfortunately caught them in the act. Instead of fleeing the scene, however, Tom's friend then knocked her out cold with a bottle. According to the friend's testimony, while he continued gathering valuable items, he then found Tom brutally sexually assaulting the woman on the floor, all while she was still unconscious. Afterwards, Tom beat her skull in with a baseball bat, 
The friend slit her wrists, and the both of them wrote all over her naked body with black ink. The men then stole her car and were later arrested after they ended up crashing it due to icy road conditions. When the deceased woman's son came home from school, he said that his mother looked completely unrecognizable. Tom's lawyers tried to plead insanity with the help from his family, who put forth evidence of Tom's erratic behavior as a child, even once pulling a knife on his own mother. Although the insanity plea was unsuccessful, Tom still ended up serving a pitiful amount of time in prison for what I see as the most disturbing role in the murder. Tom's friend was released in 2016. They didn't receive life sentences because of some weird discrepancy with the initial robbery being done during the daytime and not at night, which is absolutely ridiculous and shows just how crooked our criminal justice system really is. After finding all of this out, I've only had one interaction with Tom. I was going to take the trash out, and his dog, who was chained up in front of his house, then lunged at me while barking like crazy. Tom came and took the dog and apologized. I absolutely love dogs, and I wasn't upset by this, and I told him it was totally fine. Not that I would have argued with him anyways. I've interned at a jail before, and I've had conversations with inmates who were on trial for murder, so I'm not necessarily intimidated easily. And I do believe in the possibility for a criminal to reintegrate into society and then be successful after proper therapy. But something about a convicted murderer living directly next to you just really hits different. I was 17 years old and I had just gotten home from my summer job working grounds crew at a golf course. During the day at work, I had been talking with my buddy about hanging out that night, so I got in the car and headed over to his house at around 5 p.m. I live in Massachusetts, so midsummer at 5 p.m., it's broad daylight. My friend's family had a big old farmhouse in a rural part of the state. Right as I was driving, my friend gave me a call and told me that he was running an errand and he would probably get home after I got there. He told me the door was open and to just go in and he'd be back soon. This was really nothing out of the ordinary, and I pulled up to his house and parked the car. I looked in his refrigerator for a beer and went to the second floor, where there was this big den area with couches and TV. I flipped the channels for a bit and, after a while, felt nature calling. I walked down the hall to the bathroom, which is right at the top of the stairs on the second floor. I sat on the toilet, picking up an old comic book from the magazine basket. Well, after a few minutes, I had heard some steps on the floor below. Assuming it was my friend, I gave a shout and then made a crude joke about my current predicament, then expecting an equally crude reply back. Nothing. I shouted yet again, saying I was in the bathroom. Still nothing. At this point, I'm thinking maybe he has headphones in. No big deal. The thump of steps start up the creaky stairs, and they sound much heavier than my friend. I feel a chill down my spine, and that's when I felt it. Something was just really off. I hear the steps get to the top of the stairs, just right outside the bathroom door. Alright dude, stop fucking with me, I say. No response. I don't really know what to do at this point, but still just hoping it's my buddy being an asshole. I wait in silence for another minute or two. Then the steps start thumping down the hallway, away from the bathroom. I waste no time finishing my business, opening the door, then running down the stairs and out of the house to the front yard. Aside from my car, the driveway is empty. It wasn't my friend playing a joke. I'm the only one here. I grab my phone and call my buddy, but he doesn't pick up. The sun is setting at this point, but it's still a bit light out, and I'm also outside now, so I've chilled out a bit, but I still can't figure out what just happened. Before I have any time to figure out my next move, my friend pulls into the driveway. He can tell I'm freaked out, and I tell him what's going on. It's only been a few minutes since I left the house, so whoever is in there must still be in there. We're young and stupid, so we go into the shed and grab a baseball bat and golf club, and decide to head in and search the place. We head upstairs slowly, expecting somebody to jump out behind every corner, but it's dead quiet. Not a creak or a scrape or any other noise. 
We slowly walked down the hall in the direction I last heard the steps going. The hall ends in a big room that has no other exits, so we know this is where the search will end. But there's no one there. No footmarks in the carpet, no furniture moved, and nothing out of place. We look absolutely everywhere. Under the furniture, storage cabinets, everything. We take a look around the rest of the house, but at this point my buddy is just telling me I'm nuts. I must have imagined it. But to this day, 15 years later, I know what I heard. There was definitely someone in that house. There was someone waiting right outside the bathroom who knew I was in there. Whatever it was, whoever it was, I'm really glad they decided to leave me alone. I grew up in rural areas my entire life. Whether it was beef farms in Tennessee or living in the middle of nowhere Florida, I've done it all. Growing up without access to most commonalities we've grown accustomed to. Yeah, that's right. We had no internet, no TV, and yep, you guessed it, no cell phones. I know, the horror, right? I like to think of us as the last true generation before the internet age. Not to say dial-up wasn't around, but most of us at the time didn't really have access to it. But honestly, it really wasn't that bad. I mean, outside of the long, boring summer days where we'd be cooking alive in the fields. Living out in an old Civil War cabin in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, definitely showed out some interesting experiences. The story is going to be one of many that I share. That is, if you all enjoy this one, that is. The story starts off like any other, really. It was a typical Friday night, and my brothers and I were home alone. Being that we didn't have much of anything to entertain ourselves with, we began playing manhunt in and around the house. Most of the time we opted to stay indoors as it was pitch black outside. For a bit more context, our cabin was situated on top of a rather steep hill that had a long winding driveway running down it. Our cabin had a basement level, the main level where most of the house was, and the upstairs that only had my room. We also had a back deck that was situated about 10 to 12 feet up in the air, if I had to guess. Anyway, back to the story at hand. It was pitch black outside, and going much further than our porch at night wasn't really something anyone enjoyed doing out there. The game was fun, but was already getting pretty monotonous with the little room we had inside. At this point, I had the bright idea to wander off outside and then hide on the roof to make the game more interesting. Well... This would soon be one of the biggest regrets in my life. At first, everything seemed fine. It was rather cold and it was nearing fall and the weather was just starting to change. There was a slight breeze and the air was really crisp and calming. After a few minutes of sitting up on the roof though, something felt off. I had been practically mesmerized by the sound of crickets and cicadas. I realized though that all the noise had suddenly stopped. This seemed very odd to me, but at the same time, being as naive as I was at the time, I didn't realize that this only meant something bad was going to happen. I sit there as still as possible for a moment, trying to listen as closely as I can. I just can't seem to hear anything aside from the slight breeze through the leaves. Then as quickly as the silence came, an eruption of noise came from the other end of the roof. For a bit more detail, we had a metal roof at the time, making it very easy to hear when things walk on the roof. It sounded like something had landed on the opposite side end of the roof. I looked over, but could see nothing. This of course left me rather unnerved, and my first thought was to exit the situation. Before panicking fully, I remembered it could be my brothers messing with me, since surely they would have given up on looking for me by now. I opened up my window and called my brothers. They both ran up the stairs shouting and complaining that the roof was off limits. As my older brother got to me, I had asked him if he had been messing with me and making the noise on the roof. He of course denied this and wanted to come up and investigate. So he and I slowly made our way to the middle of the roof and listened for a moment. Everything went quiet around us as it had earlier. At this point, I was already on edge and ready to karate chop a demon right in the neck if I had to. We hear what sounds like a pounding noise on the far end of the roof in the opposite direction of where we were standing. 
After what I think were three sets of six pounding noises, it charged us. I think it did anyway. It sounded like hooves were running on the metal roof, but the only issue was we couldn't see a thing. The entire roof was clear, aside from us that is, but somehow we were hearing these footsteps. It quickly approached us and began running circles around us. I held my arms out to try and see if I could feel anything, but I couldn't. The weirdest part of it all though was that I could feel the vibrations of the footsteps all around us, but I couldn't see or feel anything in the air. These footsteps circled around us for what seemed like many minutes, but were probably no more than a minute or so at most. It suddenly stopped circling us and we could hear the steps draw off the roof and then disappear into thin air. We quickly ran inside, locked all the windows and doors, and huddled up inside. Freaked the hell out. When I was nine, I was staying home alone. It was early morning, and I had just gotten out of the shower and brushed my teeth. I put on my favorite outfit, set up a little area in the living room with a drink and a snack, and then turned on the TV to watch something. The phone rang. I went across the house to go answer it. The voice on the other end was, well, really familiar and really comforting for me. He asked me about my day so far and he made small talk. After about a minute or so, he then said, I like your outfit. Is pink your favorite color? I replied back with, Oh, thank you. Uh, no, it isn't. What were you planning on watching on TV? He asked. It took me a few seconds to understand what was happening as I was only nine years old and very naive. The voice on the other end of the phone then changed. It became deep and raspy and horrific. The voice then proceeded to describe all these horrible things that they wanted to do to me, and in detail. I went numb. My skin felt as if it were on fire and my heart was racing. I had never been more terrified in my entire life. I slammed down the phone and then I called my mom at work. I tried to explain what happened and I'm not sure I was making much sense. She got on to me for answering the phone and she told me to go back about my day. I remember trying to explain to her that he was watching me and that he told me what I had been doing and that he knew what I was wearing. I also mentioned that I was going to call 911 because I needed help. That isn't necessary. I'm not coming home. Just don't answer the phone and go watch TV she said, and then I hung up. I was really confused and I was scared. I could feel his eyes on me. I pulled the curtains closed and I raced around the house, torn between doing what I felt was right and doing what I had been told by my mother. This whole time the phone was ringing. The second it would stop, it would just start up yet again. The sound of the phone ringing would pulse through my entire body like electricity. It was practically paralyzing me. It was like I was frozen but also on fire at the same time. I waited for a pause in the ringing and called 911. I'm home by myself and I'm 9 years old and someone's watching me and telling me they're going to kill me. I told the operator. She tried to keep me calm and she said that she would send help for me. I remember standing there listening to this kind voice just trying to help me. But I could feel every scary movie scenario just playing out behind me. Was he creeping up behind me with a knife? Was he going to shoot me through a window? Was he going to throw a rock through the glass and open the door? I just didn't know. I couldn't breathe and I couldn't feel my body. In a moment of panic, I set off the alarm to the house and ran outside. I remember this sense of relief but also this overwhelming feeling of having a separation in my reality. The house felt small and dark and really dangerous and cold. Outside felt open, as well as safe and warm. I could hear lawn mowers and the sounds of birds chirping. It was a beautiful break from that bone-chilling feeling of the phone. It was like I was watching a movie and I could see myself experience both of these environments at the same time. A neighbor was pushing his child in a swing. He was concerned. He let me stand next to him and he protected me. I could hear the sirens now. The blaring sound getting louder as they grew closer. It felt like it took an eternity, but the police finally arrived. An officer walked over to me and he asked me what happened. I did my best to explain it, but so many of the words on the phone that were used were just so embarrassing. 
I couldn't bring myself to use such adult words to a police officer. And his other words were just bone chilling. I couldn't say those either. To this day, I can still hear my young voice repeating the words. He was watching me. He said he was going to kill me. Not long after, my mom's car pulled into the driveway. She, for some reason, decided to come home. She didn't look for me or come to speak to me. She just calmly got out and then walked over to the police officer. I was standing in the doorway from the house to the garage just facing the driveway. I could see my mom and the police officer. I was watching and trying to understand, trying to figure out what was happening. Then I saw it. She was laughing. My face was swollen from tears, my heart still racing, and my skin was on fire. And my mom was laughing? What the hell was going on? Very slowly, I crept a little closer, and I then overheard. I'm so sorry about this. I guess she just got scared being home alone and overreacted. I'm really sorry. What the hell's happening? What did I do wrong? Did I imagine this? Was this a dream? Should I not have called 911? Did I actually overreact? My memory of what happened after that is a little hazy. I remember refusing to stay home alone and the sound of the phone ringing just rippling through my body. It wasn't something I liked discussing. I refused to repeat what had been said to me by the voice on the phone. My mom decided that she knew who did it, but she didn't even know the details. There was no investigation. No one was questioned. She told me it was a boy who was the same age as me who lived across the street. I knew that was impossible, but no matter how much I protested it, I was always told that it was him. Many years later, after I was an adult with my own children, we were at Christmas. Everyone was in the living room and I had gone into the back bedroom to change a diaper. As I was walking out of the room and back into the living room, I could hear my mom laughing, her voice as if she had been telling a joke. The faces of everyone else in the room told a different story. Discomfort, anguish, shock, fear, yet she was still laughing. It felt as if I was walking in slow motion. One of my older children had actually stopped me from entering the living room and sort of pushed me back into the room that I had just come out of. She just told the story of you being home alone and the man threatening to kill you. She told it like it was a joke or something. Like some funny story from your childhood, my child told me. To this day, I never learned who it was that called me. I deal with my fear of ringing phones and phone conversations on a daily basis. When I was much younger, I was considered one of the popular girls. You would think that this would be an amazing privilege for everyone to look at you and think that you were the best looking person in the room most of the time, to get all the attention from the guys that you could ever want, and sometimes even making other girls jealous felt kind of good. But let me tell you the truth about it. It really sucks. More often than not, I felt kind of bad for the girls who weren't as pretty as me, and I also felt bad for having to constantly reject a bunch of guys who were trying to date me. This was especially bad in high school. I got hit on all the time. It honestly became very distracting. I hadn't had a boyfriend up until that point. I really went out of my way to be a good girl. I always thought that if I just dated any guy that tried to pick me up, I wouldn't get the best guy that I could. So I just waited until I found a guy that I thought was worthwhile. I spent most of my time with my best friend Destiny. Me and her were really close, but I remember she almost got kind of jealous when I finally got something of a boyfriend. Me and this boy, Jake, never actually dated, but we were talking for lack of a better term. It was one of those situations where people kind of knew that we were somewhat romantically involved. Like, we would talk on the phone at night and sometimes bring each other gifts to school, things like that. People always blew it out of proportion, but it was what it was. I remember Destiny being very disapproving of Jake. She said that he was a loser and that I could do way better than him. He definitely would have not seemed like the first guy I'd have gone after. At first, he isn't the best looking guy in the world, but I think he's really cute. Or at least I did at the time. I thought his real redeeming quality was that he was the most compassionate guy I'd ever met. Unlike most guys, he actually listened to me when I spoke. I felt like he really heard me. 
and that was a heck of a lot more than could be said of any other guy that ever tried to date me before. And if I'm going to be honest, I felt more heard by him than anyone I'd ever met up until that point. The sad part was that Jake had quite a few issues. He wasn't just something of a loner. He also had this dark and mysterious side that I didn't really know anything about. Even to this day, I don't really know what was wrong with him. I just know that there is something about him that isn't quite right. And looking back, I was extremely naive to not have seen the signs before. He was disliked by so many people and it wasn't like your standard reaction where people think he's awkward or something. He totally was, but there was something else that was completely off about him. Even my dog had a bad reaction when I brought him to my house one time. And as anyone should know, if a dog doesn't like you, then there is really something wrong with you. Anyway, nothing bad really happened between us until we had a field trip one day. Our entire grade was going to a theme park about 30 minutes away. It was supposed to be a really fun thing. As long as we stayed in small groups of at least three, we could pretty much go wherever or do whatever we wanted. The idea of not having to be followed around by a teacher all day was extremely enticing. On the day of the field trip, it ended up being me and Jake and Destiny in a group of three. He really wanted us to ditch Destiny so we could go and have some fun, but I wasn't about to do that to my best friend, nor did I really want to do anything like that with him on this field trip. Most of the day went by and it was actually pretty fun. There was one point when I had walked by a water slide. Some of the kids who were riding on it splashed some of the water and got me completely soaked. I had a spare shirt in my book bag and I went to the girls' locker room to change. But this is where things got weird. There was no one in the girls' locker room. I went in there and started to change, and then I heard someone else walk in. I just assumed it was another girl or a woman. It was a pretty crowded day after all, but no, it was Jake. He started touching me very inappropriately. I told him that I really wanted to do stuff with him but just not under these kind of circumstances but he wasn't getting the hint and it really started to freak me out I could feel it in his pants rubbing against my leg his breath got heavier and heavier and he got himself really worked up finally I just had to yell at him to stop I told him that he was really freaking me out and I just got the rest of my clothes and I walked out but he didn't follow me he just let me leave I stood outside of the girls' room for a few minutes waiting for him to come out, but it was a little while before he did, probably close to five minutes. As you might imagine, I was not excited to go back in there and get him. Destiny also gave me a look when I came out. I told her that Jake was in there, but I didn't tell her what he was doing. She just asked why he was in the girls' locker room at all. I couldn't think of a good excuse. I didn't want to tell her that he was being a complete and total creep with me that day. Destiny was fed up because she wanted to go buy a pretzel. She knocked on the girl's locker room door and told Jake that he needed to come out right now. We stood there for a few seconds and we all heard some strange grunting noises. It was honestly really awkward and me and Destiny just stood there and looked at each other. Jake finally made out one last grunting noise and a few seconds later walked outside. He didn't say a word. He was kind of out of breath and... It was one of the most awkward moments of my life. We told him that we were going to get a pretzel and he just shook his head. He slowly followed behind us as we made our way to the snack bar. At the time I don't think I consciously knew it, but now that I'm a little older, I think I have a pretty good idea of what he was doing in there. As you might imagine, that was the end of mine and Jake's little romance. That was the creepiest thing I've ever seen anyone do, and it was so shocking coming from him. I felt like I'd spent so much time getting to know him only to find out that he was even creepier than all the other guys. I went to a pretty rough state school here in the UK. It was only for three years as I ended up moving schools to complete my GCSEs, but it definitely made an impression on me, as well as leaving me with a handful of anecdotes that I don't think I'll ever get tired of telling. Most of them are pretty funny. Childish antics and schoolyard gossip, that sort of thing. But one or two others tend to provoke horrified reactions from anyone I tell them to. 
And one of these stories is the story of when Mr. Broughton had enough. So there was this kid in my English class called Francis, and Francis was one of those hard cases in our year group. He basically did whatever he wanted because teachers knew that it was just easier to ignore him and teach the kids who wanted teaching as opposed to rising to his bait. Try to discipline him and Francis might just decide to throw a chair or something. As you can imagine, most teachers didn't want the smoke, so Francis basically ran year 10 for a while. And it wasn't just the teachers' lives he made miserable either. Anyone who wasn't in his little circle of friends was a target for his aggression. As I'm often fond of telling people, he literally fulfilled the archaic bully stereotype of stealing people's lunch money, and it was quite a while before the school threatened to get the police involved. I think they couldn't even expel him because he'd already been expelled once and no other school in his postcode would take him, so we were kind of legally stuck with him, I guess, and apparently so was Mr. Broughton. Francis gave all his teachers a hard time, but Broughton was a kind of exception. You see, he was a big bloke, an ex-rugby player who'd tried and failed at setting up a senior rugby team when all the year 10 and 11 lads wanted to do was play football or get high. Given the chance, he'd have crushed Francis in a second. But given all the rules on how teachers couldn't touch students, Francis knew he was basically untouchable. But that didn't mean he wasn't cautious about it. Francis definitely gave Mr. Broughton an easier time than the rest, at least, until the day he decided to push the envelope. So, that day we're sitting in English class and Broughton is trying with all his might to get us to read through Act 2 of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Francis is up to his usual tricks, trying to put people off reading, making silly innuendos, generally making a nuisance of himself. Broughton starts telling him off for it, gently, mind you, but he's still telling him to shut up and behave. Whenever anything like that happened, I just learned to zone out and let it happen. Like, as weird as it sounds, there's only so much drama you can take before student-teacher verbal confrontations just get boring. So I'm not even sure how it happened, but I just heard Francis mention something about Broughton's wife. And then a big chunk of the class did like a subdued rap battle O oh reaction, anticipating a sharp escalation. But by escalation, I purely mean verbal. There was never any chance of an actual physical fight happening, at least not between a student and teacher. That's what I thought anyway, and that turned out to be very wrong. Usually whenever Francis brought up something personal to do with the teacher, they had long since learned to ignore it. And the thing that really grabbed my attention here was that Broughton had most definitely not ignored it. He was looking up from his desk, redder than a beetroot, just staring at Francis after he made the comment about his wife. It wasn't even that bad, I don't think. From what I heard after, Broughton had said something about leaving the rest of us to get down to business, and Francis had said, Oh, just like your missus, sir. Honestly, it was still considerably less harsh than the majority of the abuse he dolled out to teachers, but still, Broughton was looking at him like he'd just slapped his wife in front of him. Young man, Broughton started. His voice is literally trembling with rage. I'm going to give you an opportunity to apologize for your comment. Francis should have taken the chance while he still had it, but it was never like him to quit while he was ahead. Oh, struck a nerve, have I, sir? Francis just gloated. He didn't recognize how serious the situation was about to get, and honestly, neither did I. I didn't expect Mr. Broughton to explode the way that he did. I didn't think he even had it in him, yet little did I know, he was about to teach Francis a lesson he'd never forget. Just apologize, Broughton said, and we can leave this here. The way he said it was so seething that the whole class was silent, waiting for Francis' retort, and I remember shifting in my seat to suddenly watch whatever he was about to do. I think everyone and their dog could see something cataclysmic was about to go down. Everyone, except Francis. Oh, touchy subject, eh, sir? He said. What, did she cheat on you or something? Having it away with a milkman on the side? At that, Broughton exploded, standing up so violently from his chair that his desk shifted a bit. 
He then marches down one of the rows of desks towards where Francis has sat, and Francis responds by standing up, stepping into the aisle, and throwing his arms up in the air like, come on then, kind of way. He'd done it before, many times than I could count, and it always ended with the teacher backing down and Francis firmly being king of the classroom. Not this time. Both of Broughton's massive rugby player hands shoot up and wrap themselves around Francis's throat. The choking sound he set out was honestly terrifying, like a sharp, constricted attempt at inhalation that just came out as a gargle. The entire class gasped as Francis threw a punch in Broughton's direction, but his reach was nothing compared to the teacher's, and his swings missed wildly as he turned increasingly red in the face. I thought Broughton might throw a punch back for a second, but he didn't. Instead, he drags Francis just a few feet toward one of the windows. These are the kind that don't open up horizontally, like a door. They're the kind that open vertically and with just a crack, if that makes sense. Safety windows, so a kid couldn't just fall out, but with an angry teacher forcing a kid towards the opening, there was still enough room for a kid to be thrown out which is exactly what Broughton appeared to be doing. He was forcing Francis' head towards the opening, pinning him down on the windowsill before forcing his head into the opening. Through a combination of choking and struggle, Francis had barely made a sound as the entire class just sat back and watched in horror. But as soon as his head was out the window, and he's looking down three stories at a concrete playground, his attitude changed completely. Sir, please. I'm sorry. Sir, no. If anyone had been about to speak up, hearing Francis talk in a way that sounded utterly terrified, it stunned everyone into silence. It was like seeing a unicorn or something you never, ever expected to see with your own eyes. A scared Francis seemed like a complete oxymoron, a total impossibility, right up until that moment. Tell me I wouldn't be doing the world a favor, Broughton said. He was angry that his voice was cracking as he screamed. Go on, tell me. Tell me who'd be sad if I just dropped you. At least a third of Francis's upper body is jammed out the window at that point. His legs are flailing, kicking at the chairs and desks behind him, and for one hot minute... I think everyone believed Mr. Broughton was actually going to drop Francis out the windows. And only then do they speak up. Kids were telling each other to go get the head, begging the teacher to leave it and let him go. But Broughton was just deaf to their pleas and continued to berate Francis as he forced him further and further out the window. It was only when Broughton once asked again, like, who's going to miss you? and Francis responded with something along the lines of, My mum. She'll be on her own. Please, mum. Mum. Hearing the hardest kid in our year literally begging for his mother, that disturbed me in a way that nothing else ever really has. In the end, when all is said and done and you're staring death in the face, it really is your mum that you think of last. Fortunately for Francis, I think that was the one thing that saved him and you could sense the shift in Broughton's demeanor almost instantly. A few seconds later, he was dragging Francis back into the safety of the classroom, but instead of carrying on the fight, Francis ran out of the classroom, clearly crying, screaming about how, I'm going to have your job for this. And to foreign readers, this just implied that he was going to get him sacked, not that Francis was literally about to take over as English teacher. I'm sure it'll be a surprise to no one to hear that Broughton ended up losing his job, but we also found out why he'd reacted so violently, and that's because his wife, the same one Francis had so flagrantly disrespected, had recently been diagnosed with cervical cancer, and I'm pretty sure it was terminal. I'm not saying he wasn't out of order for kicking off on a student like that, but at the same time I can understand why that was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. I think it was the same for my parents too. Like once they heard about Broughton getting the sack for almost murdering a student, they went into overdrive trying to find a decent school for me to prep for my exams. I left that school less than two months after that incident, and did a few weeks homeschooling while my parents petitioned the council for an emergency placement. It worked, 
I got out, and the rest is history, I suppose. But I still think of state secondary school teachers from time to time, how some of them must be living an actual nightmare on a day-to-day -day basis, and how fortunate I am that I don't have to do the same thing. One of my biggest problems is that I attract the weirdest kinds of people. There are a lot of people who say that, but you have no idea until you've met some of the people that try to hang out with me. There was one guy who took the cake, though. His name was Jonathan. He lived down the road from my parents' house. This was years ago, and thankfully I hadn't had anything to do with him in a very long time. I was your average-looking girl. I was in high school at the time, and I was extremely naive. I've had a couple of really bad experiences. I've kind of been shown the true horror of the world firsthand. Not trying to turn this into a pity party or anything, but you don't realize how cruel the world is until horrible things happen to you. And if you were idealistic about people the way I was, you'll just have to live through some bad experiences to find out. But anyway, back when I was a sophomore in high school and extremely naive about people and their intentions, I was friends with Jonathan. I thought that he was kind of a nerdy guy, but that he was capable of being a friend. Bear in mind, he was a 30-year-old who lived with his grandmother who collected social security. He didn't have a job, didn't have a girlfriend, and he thought it was a good idea to hang out with a girl in high school that lived down the street. That's the kind of guy Jonathan was. I wasn't really close with my parents, so they didn't really know anything about who I hung out with. I didn't hang out with Jonathan very much, but... I would say hi to him and have the occasional conversation from time to time. Looking back, I knew that he had some kind of crush or romantic feeling for me, but I knew that it would be against the rules for him to date me and I knew that he knew that too. But I remember when I got my first boyfriend, Jonathan was not exactly happy about it. He kept warning me about being used by boys my age. He told me that I should look for an older man who was more mature and could take care of me. Of course, he was always hinting that I should have been with him. He didn't want to come out and say it though, but every single time I ever talked about my boyfriend, who had only been dating for two weeks or so, Jonathan always had something bad to say or some kind of warning. I remember getting the whole possibly catching something from him talk from my parents, only to get it again from Jonathan. I specifically remember the way he phrased the conversation, he talked as if though my boyfriend definitely had some sort of disease, and by the way, he didn't. It was a very strange ordeal nonetheless. But then came the day before our field trip. It wasn't a big trip or anything. My school was divided into certain sections, and it was an annual event where the science department would take certain sections of students down to the park and help us scientifically observe nature. For three days, the scientific department would take a third of the students down in this park. It was pretty stupid. Everyone kind of agreed that it was just a nice way to get out of those horrible classrooms that we sit in all day. Outside Science Day, that's what we called it. I remember Jonathan asking about Outside Science Day. He asked what day I was going to be in the park. I told him and I was scheduled to go Wednesday. I didn't think anything of it. After all... He did go to the same high school I went to and it was kind of a tradition. I thought that he was just kind of curious or reminiscing. Well, was I wrong? Wednesday came and I was really excited to be going down to the park. I was hanging out with my best friend Rebecca. We got down there and started observing nature. The teachers made me bring notepads and pencils to make some scientific observations, but after a few sentences they didn't care what we did after that. The teachers sat by the picnic tables and drank lemonade, and us students were pretty much free to do whatever we wanted. Me and Rebecca were having a deep conversation about life. She said something about her stepfather and how it made her feel like marriage was a bad idea or something. I don't really remember, it was a very long time ago. I just remember being 100% engaged in this conversation with Rebecca. And all of a sudden, I felt a hand touch my shoulder. I thought it was one of my friends playing a joke on me or something, but I turned around and it was Jonathan. Things got extremely awkward really fast. Me and Rebecca were kind of in the middle of it and 
He was my awkward older neighbor showing up at my school class trip. Jonathan asked me if I wanted to go back with him to hang out at his house for a little while. I told him that I would get in trouble, but he promised that the teachers would never find out. By this point, I knew exactly what he was doing, and I wasn't about to play into that. I told him that I couldn't leave my best friend Rebecca, but then he offered to bring Rebecca too, and that was even creepier. I remember getting a look from Rebecca like, why do you know this freak? After Jonathan kept pleading with us, me and Rebecca finally decided to just walk back to our teachers and hope that Jonathan would get the hint. But when we started walking through, Jonathan grabbed me. He grabbed me by the ankle and I fell to the ground. We were standing on wood chips and I remember getting some in my mouth when I fell. He started dragging me. We were far enough from the teachers that they couldn't see us easily and our view was mostly obstructed from the rest of the students by a swing set so nobody noticed that this grown man was dragging me away. I lucked out in the end. Rebecca actually started fighting him. She punched him in the nose and started screaming for the teachers. Right after she did that, Jonathan started running. He ran as fast as I've ever seen anyone run away in my life. I didn't realize how quick he actually was. The teachers asked about the incident and questioned me as to whether or not I knew this man. I told them that I didn't. It turned into a giant headache. They called the police and everything. I told the police that it was just a stranger and that I was as vague as I could be when I described him. For some reason I felt like I would get in trouble if they knew it was Jonathan. Now, I understood that I should have reported him to the police, but I foolishly didn't at my naive age. The experience turned into a good thing for Rebecca too. She always bragged about punching a grown man in the face and him running away. I was pretty sure that Jonathan was running because he didn't want the teachers to see him and not because Rebecca's punch necessarily hurt him that bad, but I never told Rebecca that. After that incident, Jonathan never showed his face anywhere near me ever again. I think he was familiar enough with my schedule that he knew when I got on and off the bus and he just stayed away from me. That was the first time in my life that I was faced with this sort of dark reality. The sad reality that someone who claimed to be my friend actually had very dark and sinister intentions all along, and anyone with two eyes could have seen. If you're like me, do yourself a favor and be more cynical about people. At least that way, the only surprises will be good ones. The weird thing about dating someone with a mental illness is that they can seem like an otherwise normal person, at least until they snap in whatever way they do. This happened to me with the girl I dated back in high school. We didn't go to the same school though. She went to our neighbor rival school. There was something of a friendly competition between our two schools. Believe it or not, we actually met at a football game. Anyway, I ended up dating this girl. It was sad because she was actually a really nice person, but her mental illness made her extremely unbearable. She wouldn't get into this extremely depressive and anxious mood, and then would act really strange. And it would come about from the most random stuff. I had previously been dating a girl for about two years, even before I was in high school, and I totally had a crush on her for a long time before that. Things ended when I found out that she had tried sleeping with one of my friends, and thankfully, my friend put bros before hoes and let me know about it immediately. But yeah, I had just stopped with that relationship, so I was in need of a good rebound. And that's where this girl comes in. We'll call her Erica. It was a few weeks after I had been single. I was at this football game just trying to pass the time. That was when I looked over and saw the perfect goth girl. She wasn't overly goth or anything, she didn't even have any piercings or tattoos that I knew of, but she gave off that vibe if that makes any sense. I had always been interested in girls like that, so I made eye contact with her, got her phone number, and texted her that night. The thing that really made me like her was that she played Xbox. How many times do you ever get a cute girl's number and she also plays video games? I wasn't sure if I was going to ask her out until that point, but... She told me her gamer tag was Bad Chick X42, and I knew I had to go for it. 
I was normally more careful about vetting girls that I planned on dating, but I figured it would make for a good time. Worst case scenario, I broke up with her because I didn't like her and then I never saw her again. I tell you all this backstory so you can get a good picture of what me and Erica had going on. It was very relaxed, it wasn't serious, and I never once got the idea from her that things were a big deal. She also told me that she had really bad anxiety. When she told me, I didn't think much of it. I figured that everyone gets anxious once in a while, and I had no idea how bad her anxiety actually got. I remember there being this one day when I had a field trip in my school. It was as lame as you can imagine, but it beat sitting in class. So I signed up and was looking forward to the day when it came. The night before the field trip, I didn't text Erica, which was unusual because we normally text each other every night sometimes into the early hours of the morning. I just wasn't feeling it that night. I was kind of sad and I just wanted to be alone and eat pizza rolls while I watched that 70s show. The next day came around and I forgot that it was the day of the field trip. I wasn't quite dressed to walk around, I had my jeans on, but it wasn't the end of the world. Me and two of my best friends sat together on the bus and waited to get there. I think there were about three or four buses from our school that left. It was a pretty big field trip, and I think just about everyone in my school went. Now, on to the interesting part. I saw my ex-girlfriend on the field trip. She went to my school, by the way. It was around lunchtime, and she approached me. She tried apologizing for being a bad girlfriend back in the day and tried to actually get back together with me. I wasn't a jerk toward her, but I did tell her no. I told her that I would never be able to trust her again. About a day or two later, she reached out to me again, but this time, she asked me if I knew someone. A gothic-looking girl. I guess this goth-looking girl had approached my ex-girlfriend and asked for a whole bunch of questions. I immediately knew it was Erica. I told my ex not to worry about it and that she wouldn't be hearing from this goth girl again. At this point, I felt uneasy about the whole situation. It just seemed like a really strange thing to do. Again, what me and Erica had was not very serious and the fact that she was kind of stalking me made me feel really anxious. I only knew her for a couple of weeks at this point and if this was what she was going to do, where is this possibly going to lead? I talked to her about it. She straight up admitted to stalking me while I was on the field trip. She said that she felt anxious about me cheating on her because I didn't text her the night before. Then she told me that she took a couple of pictures of me talking to my ex-girlfriend. She told me that she had somehow found her and confronted her. I felt really anxious at this point and tried not to act shocked. The entire time I couldn't help but think about how much I regretted asking her for her cell phone number. And this is where things seriously got out of hand. I guess you could tell by my facial expression that I was really freaked out and that's when she decided to threaten me. She looked me right in the eyes and said that she would kill me if I told anyone. I know what you're thinking. It doesn't sound as bad as it was. If you could see the look in her eyes when she said that to me, you would have been anxious about it too. I continued texting her and acting like nothing happened for a couple more days. She apologized and said that she gets carried away sometimes. And I gave it about a week before I just kind of straight up blocked her. She really freaked out. I knew I was taking some kind of risk when I did so. I wasn't sure if she was serious when she said that she was actually going to kill me or not. I remember being really paranoid for a couple of days. She didn't know where I lived, but she knew where I went to school, and she had the ability to track down someone that she only had a picture of. I have no idea how she tracked down my ex-girlfriend just from seeing her one time and having one picture of her. The scary part of the story is that she told me that she would end my life and then end herself. She sent it to me as a message and I read it through email so I'm not sure how serious she was about it. All I know is that she is an extremely capable person. Again, just think about how much went into finding my ex-girlfriend or even stalking me on the field trip in the beginning. You couple that level of capability with someone who is seriously mentally unhinged and you throw a violence threat as icing on the cake, and you got yourself a real recipe for disaster. I really don't want to say anything to anyone because I know that if the word gets out, 
my reputation could potentially be ruined. People would think that I'd be the kind of person to run and hide and start crying at the first instance of a small goth girl threatening me. I know that's not how the situation is, but I know that's how people would react to it if they heard. It's been a while since I've had any form of communication with Erica. I blocked her email, phone number, and every social media account you can imagine. I'm just hoping that she can let sleeping dogs lie and let me live my life. And as worried as I am about it, I still feel bad for her. I really hope she gets the help that she so desperately needs. <laughs>